Hello and welcome to Varm Blog. And today I'm with David Griscom of Left Reckoning fame, um, writer, uh, podcaster, doer of other things. Um, it's always funny trying to figure out how you introduce people. So, um, David, how you doing? I'm doing good, man. Just hoping that uh, the power in our beleaguered Texas grid doesn't uh, run out on me today, as we've gotten warnings from ERCOT that that might be a likely thing happening this week. Yeah, I was... Uh... We were talking off air and about that, and I thought it was ironic given that you just published a piece of Jacobin about the failures of the liberal understanding of of the power grid. And I wanted to go into that with you because while it is true that the independent power grid is sort of a, a bugaboo for Texas, and um, there's a lot of hay made out of it, particularly by all kinds of, of people, both in the mainstream media and in like fringe right-wing media. It's always fun listening to someone like Alex Jones misunderstand the power grid in Texas. Mm. That's that's a fun thing to do. Um, at the same time, you you were pointing out to me in a, and I was looking at your article here in Jacobin, um, Texas shows the pitfalls of liberal climate, of liberal climate politics, and we'll come back to that in a second, uh, that there there is a way in which just focusing on the fact the grid is independent and thus can't buy and receive power from other states is not the only problem. I mean, mm-hmm. um, they're rolling blackouts in California. That's not um, a independent power grid problem. That is a neoliberalized power grid mm-hmm. problem. Um, and for those who want to know what I mean by neoliberal, because I, I, I now have to define it because it gets it is a term that gets abused. Um, fuck, I've even heard uh, Alex Jones not throw this term around. And that's when I was like, it's over. <laughs> yeah, I can't use it true. anymore. Um, but so neoliberal in the sense that we mean here, I define in the Philip Murawski way, which is the it is the public private partnership. So it seems Mm-hmm. Like it's open free market, but it's actually not, um, which is neither here nor there because almost nothing is actually free market. That's a whole different uh, discussion. But there's a specific way in which market resources and marketized access um, are funded through state funds, are through state land grants and and whatnot uh, in order to make them more profitable and more efficient. In no case has there been significant evidence that that these neoliberal structures in monopoly um, utilities like power are more efficient. Um, And while that's been known probably definitively since the mid 90s, that has not changed the policy base, Um, even as it seems worldwide neoliberalism is beginning to really crack up on its initial premises. Um, So I think there's a couple of things that come to mind to me about this, because in one sense, it illustrates to me the problem that a lot of us have with, there's a lot of, and and liberal and in left thinking, if we're completely honest, right? 
there's a lot of over reductiveness in the way we talk about complex phenomena. So we go, mm-hmm. okay, well, Texas is great. It's fucked up because it's independent and it's neoliberalized, but we're, we're like, we're going to ignore the fact that a lot of the dependent grid is also neoliberalized. Um, so, you know, and it's in its peach mail with some big monopoly power, uh, some monopoly companies, some co-ops that are not totally neoliberalized running power in certain areas. Um, and your access and how it works is totally just kind of arbitrary on where your geographic location is. You don't have a lot of control over it. Um, and even from the standpoint of the neoliberal argument, which is hilarious to me, because I'm like, well, how on earth is market competition going to lead to more efficiency when you can't have market competition in a in a monopoly utility? There's no way to have it. Like we can't have competing power lines. Everybody immediately knows that well, won't they're work. They're trying. <laughs> yeah, they try a lot of things. Um, so let's uh, let's turn into that a little bit. So what yeah. do you think? What do you think the left doesn't the left in specific, and then left and liberals in general misunderstand about the power grid problem and the and the coming power problems that we're going to have in the United States. I mean, Texas well, to me is to me emblematic. No, it it it, it certainly is, and um, I mean maybe just to get everybody on on the same page here, you know, the piece um, too, like it's it's really focused a lot on the oil industry, and I'd like to mm-hmm. get to talking about that soon too. But um, like just on the grid um, because it, it's it's notable right now. I mean. It was one of those things when the when the grid failed during the w- winter storm. Um, immediately, Texas fell into a culture war. Right, we're like we're talking about actual systems and ways that we produce electricity. But it was like if you're a liberal, you're out there saying wind and solar are great and there's no problems with it. And of course, the Republicans in the right wing were saying, well, it's because we're doing Green New Deal policies in Texas, which of course on its face is absurd. And the argument that no, it was not wind and solar that failed, then. Um, but rather the natural gas uh, pipelines that froze over uh, during the winter storm, that misses a bit of of the point. Um, just in that, certainly, like there is like the actual question of infrastructure and how we're protecting infrastructure. But that conversation neatly avoids the central problem, which is profit um, and privatization of these systems. So, what ended up happening for the guys? So. What ended up happening is when those pipelines froze over, right, those producers, they lost revenue for a day, a couple hours, a couple days. And certainly that hits their bottom line, but nothing close to the amount of money that it would cost them to properly weatherize those pipelines. Right. So they're making a decision that, hey, it makes more sense for us to potentially lose the ability to sell for a couple of days versus spending the millions of dollars to uh, weather, weatherize our systems. And for the boys and, and, and the folks who uh, ended up having plants that were still running during that time, they made what, quote unquote, they were holding, quote unquote, a lottery ticket. And they made millions upon millions of dollars over those few days. And then as you know, months and weeks went on, Texans were getting bills for thousands of dollars um, for having their electricity staying on uh, during that crisis. So people who thought that they were spared the crisis ended up getting hit with these massive bills, which, of course, the state is um, has been very, very weak on trying to do anything to sort of uh, lessen the blow of those. So, you know, the the, the fundamental point here is that we have a, a, a system in Texas, um, which is hyper deregulated, deregulated and hyper privatized. Um, but it's not unlike, as you were saying, things that we're seeing in New York uh, State or in California, where this kind of neoliberal ideology of, of deregulated power um, has also taken hold. The thing to note about the Texas system, just for people who aren't familiar with it, is that there are parts of the state that are like purely deregulated. And what I mean by that is that when you get your house um, and you want to set up electricity there, you don't just call the power provider. You have five or six different groups that you can choose from. oh wow so you actually yeah. do have competing power lines <laughs> now not everywhere like not in austin not in san antonio not in many of the major cities but particularly people in rural and like suburban texas that is the case yeah so no it, it is like like the like the pure dream in a lot of ways of this kind of pure deregulated 
market competition um, for providers a system that you see put up by the right. And also a lot of people on the liberal side are willing to go with it because they do to uh, believe in this idea that competition is necessarily going to lower the price of electricity. And again, that hasn't been the case. People who have the one system, like people in Austin, we pay much less um, for electricity the neighbors um, who are on like that purely deregulated system, because right? So like, would be inefficient. Like, there's no way for that system to be efficient, right? Like, it's 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 not efficient, um, and because those smaller firms are buying off of like this the state grid, they're having they're they are more like reflective of um, the spikes in energy prices because it's a constant auction house that at this point is pretty much automated, where the price of electricity will skyrocket when there's lots of demand, and it will go down when there's less demand. Um, so it's, it's, it's so a real mess. Introduce a middleman for no reason. Yeah, totally. And, you know, a very well-funded and protected middleman. Um, I always remind folks that, you know, Greg Abbott after, after the winter storm received something like $11 million, um, from the energy industry here in Texas, when it became clear that there weren't going to be any serious uh, reforms for it. And just in the spirit of fairness, cause we try to be fair, right, Varn? Um, they did do a little bit and they did demand that um, natural gas pipelines weatherize, but there's no enforcement mechanism. Um, and like the deadline to doing so is so far off in the future that is effectively meaningless. Um, yeah, so it's 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 a real nightmare. But um, I, I wrote the piece and I've been thinking about this a lot because obviously climate politics is very important and it's becoming more and more um not necessarily realizable in the sense of like getting what maybe we would like. Um, but in the sense that like, there is going to be some form of action on it. And I think that the left in particular needs to start getting very serious about, you know, for so long, like the slogan in the environmental left movement has been like, you know, we need to do something about climate change. And like, I totally agree, but I'm also starting to wonder and get worried that there hasn't been much investigation into what um, we need to do. Um, so that was really the crux and the motivation for, for writing the piece and trying to dispel and sort of set people on a common uh, framework for understanding the way that these systems work. And most notably, the fact that finance capital really runs all of these systems from the electric system to the oil industry. And if we want to be serious about doing something about that, that certainly needs to be front and center included in the way that we're talking about any kind of transition away from fossil fuels. And I think that's absolutely true. And I, I think your point about finance capital needs to be understood a little better because there, there is a real sense in which finance capital is the only way a lot of these things are profitable on a capitalist market mm -hmm. is future speculation. Mm -hmm. And for those who don't, I was trying to explain this to, to another Marxist the other day who didn't really understand how the futures market worked. I'm like, how you make money in the futures market is you're basically gambling on price access now versus increase of price later. Mm -hmm. And that's the only way in which you make money. Um, futures market's very stable. It's actually a low profit yield uh, commodity. Um, and I'm not saying that in the, the, the kind of highly specific Marxist sense. I mean, in general, like if you're on an investor pension fund, you mm -hmm. invest in, in futures. Most of them are stable, but they're not high yield. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, one of my, my big pushes against you know, against this kind of capitalism, and capitalism in general, but particularly this kind of capitalism, is that not only is it extremely wasteful, um, it doesn't really work. Uh, it is very hard to make certain of these sectors profitable. And if you like do studies on like energy path dependence, for example, um, you discover that we're actually putting as much energy into getting that energy and maintaining our current grid as we're getting out of it. So we're accelerating the, the, the fossil fuel mm -hmm. depletion to get fossil fuels, which is kind of hilarious. And in some ways, we've actually hit peak oil. It's just the way people understood that 15 years ago. They thought they would mean like we'd be in some kind of post-oil apocalypse. And what's mm -hmm. actually happened is we just are willing to spend tons of energy to get the energy out of the ground because we, it would cost us so much to fix our infrastructure. But I think there's another point that your article really gets into and... 
Now, I don't want to get into the debate about whether Dutch small farmers are petite bourgeois or not. Um, I don't want to get into the debate about whether the yellow jackets are all secretly white ring in France. But there has been a way in which progressive energy policy has not has been shoved on the backs of labor that turns labor, particularly rural labor, against mm-hmm. it. A, a friend of mine works for the Sierra Club. And he was he thought he was going in to do racial uh, environmental justice and then realized very quickly that unless he really started figuring out how to get rural um, workers on board, regardless of their race, that he had no grounds Mm. to deal with this and that environmentalism was increasingly seen as sort of the hobby of people who want pretty parks and rich people who are trying to screw Uh, rural working people. Um, It also puts urban working people and rural working people in direct opposition. And and this is a historical problem for a long, long time. Um, And I don't hear just mean, I think your article makes it pretty clear. We're not just talking about like petite bourgeois farmers. We're talking about workers Mm -hmm. and some of the most important logistics sectors of the economy. Um, Like the ones for which if things don't work, everything falls apart um <laughs> like no, it's the way everything. that we i mean it's and i mean in, in particular the energy industry i mean it's the way that we survive it's the way that you power your home you cook your food you know and make sure that you can li- be in a livable um you know climate in, in, inside your house right it's like these are important questions um uh, and and the um pushing out of, of, of that sector in, in the environmental movement, I think has been to its detriment. I want to, I, I feel like you're getting um, to, to a question that I want to answer, but I just did want to note real quick mm-hmm. a point that Matt Huber uh, makes somebody who I learn a lot from. I can't remember the name of the piece, but it's one of his pieces in catalyst uh, magazine, Jacobin's kind of theory journal. Um, but he, he really starts to dissect this um, kind of NGO climate activist language called frontline communities. Right. Which I would assume maybe your friend was sort of interacting with where it's like, you know, it's, it's part of the moral case for for doing something about climate change, where it's like there are communities that are going to be hit worse than other communities, particularly, you know, communities of color, working class communities, poor communities, etc. Um, but the one of the real disconnects between that kind of activist language and the like on the ground experience is that most people in those communities don't consider themselves to one be frontline communities or to be in communities that are going to be significantly affected by climate change. And the reason I bring that up is because it's just a very classic example of like a kind of NGO activist environmental movement, um, you know, terminology that is like speaking for people instead of that doing that work of being rooted within them and, and listening to the demands and the worries and the, the considerations of people in those communities is saying we're going to make this moral claim because we know that like liberals in New York City are going to get very worked up about it if we make it in this case. And let's also not forget, too, that in the terminology of like the frontline communities, it was sort of set up um, in a proposal to the Biden administration um, to sort of, you know, we're allocating more money to frontline communities than to other communities, which, again, creates this kind of anti solid you know, solidarity mentality where it's like, are you enough of a frontline community to get significant, you know, funding for a Green New Deal program or something like that or not? Right. And, um, you know, I think reintroducing labor and reintroducing politics, frankly, into these into these plans and the way that we're thinking about building a solution to this is, is really, really crucial. And I think that that's a pretty clear example as to some of the failures that we've seen so far. Yeah, it's it's an amazing fault of democratic politics in America, but of, of, of left liberal politics in general, to equate fairness, um, actually, if I'm completely frank, to give a shit about fairness at all, <laughs> like, um, which I, I know this is to sound shocking, but like you fix social, the way to be fair in fixing a social problem is to fix the social problem, totally. not worrying about fixing it for these specific people first, because they have so many other disadvantages, blah, 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 blah. Um, there's the, you know, I have my disagreements with the Frankfurt school, but you know, and thousands of them, but there is a sense in which the, the adage that Adorno said, everybody lives in a just world or no one does is absolutely true. Um, and 
I think, you know, I was pulled from education where, for example, we've been talking about high needs communities for a long time in higher ed, right? But what do we actually see? The representation of higher ed of upper middle class and upper class people, including people of color, has actually increased and on average um the people of color in higher ed are actually richer than the white students that enter too which is a weird proof of a systemic racism any still going on but b that this is not doing what you think it's doing it's not Mm. fixing the historical injustices for the vast majority of people of color um and when you really look at it, what you see is what's actually happened at a lot of these universities is, yes, there is some acceptance of poor people and people of color in the United States, but there's a lot of meeting those quotas by going and pulling in foreign students, counting them for your diversity count, and also taking massive amounts of money in, in, uh, in tuition. And then it leads to this weird bizarro even back to our immigration policy where the richest groups in the country are Southeast Asians and Nigerians from two of the poorest countries um, in the developed, well, in the developed, semi-developed world, um, which is a wild proposition to think about, right? It, mm. it is crazy to think about that um, because I've been to Nigeria. It's not rich. <laughs> like, um, <laughs> you know, uh, it's not, it's also not like the third world shithole that people portray it as sometimes on, on the news, but it's not, it doesn't make a lot of logical sense until you look at these backdoor issues. Mm -hmm. So what you see in, and I'm going to get with this on energy policy in a second, but what you see is this really perverse incentive system where it, we say we're doing something for justice. Some people do benefit locally from that justice action, but a lot of how it's actually done is to help out elites and create weird dynamics in the system um by and large and there's been a lot of backlash to that because people are catching on that this is what's happening but unfortunately um and this is where our our, uh i don't know how you feel about adolf reed i like a lot of his work but this is where adolf Mm -hmm. reed is is somewhat right framing this this way he he talked about that he talked about this 10 years ago um, leads to a backlash amongst white people who would be on your side anyway, and a backlash amongst working class people and even people of color who now see this as inter competition with other people of color mm-hmm. for certain accesses and resources. This has a totally anti solidist solidaristic effect. Um, and in the energy sector, it's doubly compounded, I think, because unfortunately, and, and this is one of the examples, I uh, a year ago. The progressive Democrats were really, 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 really insistent on the bid back better program that they got mm-hmm. a gas tax. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, why is the biggest, most important plank of your Green New Deal that you're focusing in on the regressive tax mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that is going to turn a lot more working people against you? Because you haven't replaced the the oil system yet either. All you're doing is ways and costs to them, and they have no other options. Totally. I mean, and like it, that that in particular, like makes the mistake of in, in the same way with education, right? It tries to put like uh, <laughs> um, it tries to do something at like the end of the pipeline. And what I mean by that is like an education system, an entire system of you know generations of of inequity and exploitation and then current underfunding of you know elementary high schools etc and then you try to do something at the top and as you say it has these kind of unintended or maybe it is intended um you know it has th- those kind of effects which are not what is sort of promoted and same thing with like a gas tax right which like there's no doubt that like we need to fix the fact that we are an automobile society in this country but you don't do that by putting cost burdens on poor and working class people on the end of it people who have no like because like that's I mean that's such a neoliberal logic too right the idea is that like we'll um we'll make it more expensive for you to drive around so that you either drive less or you get a you know very fuel efficient car but again for the people who are getting affected by this the most 
that this you know buying a more fuel efficient car is not really an option um nor is really driving less because they have to be driving to work oftentimes people are having to commute 30 40 minutes especially as we see the uh you know the crisis in housing where all of like the workforce in cities is having to commute in every day right like it comes at the it, it comes at the end of the cycle and it's 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 incredibly um perverse where it's like something that would help everybody for example that would reduce the need for burning fossil fuels would be a significant investment in public transportation right um and there is this kind of fear of doing anything big like that even from some people i i, I think um there are leftists who think this way too i had an argument yeah. with some, okay, i'm not going to go. give a, me an example then so i don't, uh, yeah, I don't have to rely um, on anybody um <laughs> i had an argument with a sociologist who i'm not going to name who sometimes writes for jacobin about uh biden's better fuel initiative about why even why prices are going up on the time even even mm -hmm. when crude is not so if you compare the cost of crude oil uh to in 2000 and let's say seven when the last time we had a major gas where gas prices were close to this high uh adjusted for inflation mm -hmm. were about this high um you what you see is that the percentage of of the of the cost that's actually crude oil has actually gone down so the crude so there's more cost there's mm -hmm. more cost now that there are other things um a lot of people automatically interpreted that as greed um i i don't actually i don't think that's all that's going on there one one thing i will say is yeah complaining about greed in capitalism is like complaining about uh carnivores eating meat like that's how it works like it's how it functions <laughs> it's just like um it literally can't work another way it we, like it, to be a non-greedy capitalist is in many cases mm -hmm. to lose um but uh i got pushback because there are all these oil regulation things and a couple of them i really don't agree with for example uh, I don't think ethanol makes oil cleaner, nor does it help the mm -hmm. environment, nor mm -hmm. does it actually reduce yeah. emissions. Um, but all that aside, and particularly in a food crisis, yeah. that we're kind of having it. It seems particularly irresponsible to increase your ethanol percentage. Um, but the there were other things where I was like, yeah, but you're arguing that this should be on the backs, whether you realize it or not. And this is a socialist. All right. Mm -hmm. This is a person who writes articles defending Hugo Chavez. Like, uh, you're arguing that the cost of this should be at the back end of, of, of workers, you know, if you're supporting Biden on this. And it's not that I'm saying that all the Biden reforms are bad. There are about four. Uh, one of them I, I, I kind of reject. The other three I don't. Look, I think they might help on margin. Um, some of them include, like, safety concerns and pipelines, um, and stuff like this the but to put that on the back of the people at the price pump means that you are turning workers against you mm -hmm. and turning workers concerns not from their production and their role in production but their role in survival and consumption and that is a like it is actually doing the thing we complain about neoliberals doing which is seeing workers as consumers well you're making policy that way like so I think that's a fundamental failure. And I think I think leftists rightly care so much about the environment that sometimes they also fall into this logic because there's no one not operating on this logic. Even, quote, socialist states right now are operating on this kind of semi-marketized logic. Um, and so it's hard to say, like, this won't work. And it's not only not going to work, it's going to turn the people you vitally need to be on your side against you. Yeah. And like, this is this is something that's extremely worrying to me. I mean, again, like, because you're seeing the popularity of certain kinds of, you know, green leftism that effectively are going to mean austerity for working people. Um, and I, I see a lot of work being done right now to sort of prepare people for that. Like we need to make a collective sacrifice, you know, all this kind of stuff. When again, it, you know, if, if you're not targeting the engine of, of this system, you're just allowing those people to continue making incredible amounts of profit from the system while putting the social cost, be it financial and also, you know, just general, um, on, on, on the backs of working people. And I, I agree with you, like 
one that it's it's wrong it's incorrect analysis but it's also just politically suicidal because if you start to make things like green policy something that is the enemy of of, of the working class like what macron tried to do um in france right you put yourself um in into a very big um you're digging yourself into a hole and trying to get a democratic majority to be able to put these things in place. I did just want to note a couple of things about like the current state of, of the oil industry. Cause I think it's really important again to mm. like re up this, this point here. It's like, okay, yes, there is this uncertainty that comes from the Russian invasion of, of Ukraine. And there is undoubtedly issues when it comes to the supply chain right now. I, I think that it's overstated, but you know, let's just give them their, their due. Cause this is what they cite, why the prices are going up. But even the um, the government um, has come out with reports saying that the government, the EIA, puts out reports on the state of the oil and gas industry, right? And I've been particularly interested, obviously, in, in what's happening um, in Texas because you're hearing Greg Abbott go on and say, like, the price of gasoline is so high because Joe Biden is, you know, pursuing Green New Deal policies, right? Which, again, is just absurd on its face, um, especially when you remember the fact that Joe Biden in March alone – Uh, The government approved over 900 new drilling permits in the Permian Basin, right? There is an increase in availability um, for exploration um, in in the oil and gas industry right now. And the industry is making record profits. But again, being good Marxists, we need to remember and ask what's being done with that profit. Is that going back into the industry to rehire the nearly 60,000 plus people who were fired when the price of gasoline fell tremendously during the pandemic? Not really. It's going back to shareholders in the form of dividends because those corporations want to remind those folks that even when we face you know, minor downturns, you will always get the bag at the end of the day. And remembering the fact that there are trillions of dollars invested in, in the oil and gas industry by banks, by private investors, and those people want returns on that. Remember that the oil and gas industry is not in the business of producing oil and gas for consumption. It is in the business of making money. And the fact that it produces oil um, for people to use is just like a you know a secondary side effect of of that system um and again it's just like you know you want to come at all these things of if you find the perfect price like it's also again like the tax thing is such a neoliberal infection too because it's this idea that like if you find the perfect price for gasoline um you know then like the system will reform itself right if gasoline has to stay at six dollars a gallon or something like that then we will see a dramatic decrease in in emissions which again i don't know if is is necessarily true just because of the fact that our infrastructure in this country right now is not equipped to maintain a system like that but again you're putting the costs on everyday people and not addressing the root cause of these things where production is okay right now uh, we had like a, a little bit of, of high demand and, and scarcity that temporarily increased the prices. But sitting here right now in um, what July, I'm so I'm like I've been very uh, out of sync with dates lately. I mean, crude in oil July just, 2022, just tanked, right? Crude oil, crude yeah, it's, oil, the it's, crude oil market just completely tanked. Like, and they're putting the and they're putting the money from the profits that they got into the pockets of of shareholders. So again, like dropping the climate change thing for a second, right? Like let's just say for a second that like the cri- we we don't have this real crisis of having to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels, just as a socially necessary industry, right? As something that provides power for us to get to work and do all the things that we do, right? The private industry is completely failing people for the benefit to the benefit of of the wealthy and shareholders. Um, in general. Yeah, man, this, there, there's so much here to, to backstop. One thing I want to point out to people, is for the last, say, 15 years, um, and it was very quiet, from the 70s to the beginning of the, the Obama administration, we always talked about American energy independence and how we were never going to have it. Mm-hmm. We have it. Yeah. Our, we have North American energy independence. The Canadian U.S. market produces enough oil f- to be self-sufficient for both countries on its own right now. The market fluctuations related to Ukraine are about market futures and access mm-hmm. on the global financial market. It's not even about access to oil here. We have it. Oh, now, totally. We have, we have problems. We have not been we 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 have not been investing into infrastructure for a long time. So we have too few uh, few. Um, Refinering facilities, uh, we have off uh, offloaded that to developing world countries who will deal with the spill on the environmental problems, et cetera, and so forth. And then we have our remaining facilities are in places that 
while are good for shipping, are terrible for things like, I don't know, all the climate change disasters that are hitting the coast all the time. Um, thank you, Gulf Coast, getting battered constantly. And that's where most of our refineries are for some stupid mm -hmm. reason. I mean, I know why they're there. It's actually, it's shipping logistics, but it's like if you were designing this from the standpoint of safety or of efficiency, that's moronic. Um, mm -hmm. It's there for, it's, it's path dependent on shipping efficiency and that's the only vector being considered. However, when, when I hear a lot of progressives and stuff talk about this, they don't seem to understand these points. Um, and, I, and there's a lot of stuff that I, you know, you know, I am allied to some people who have some really radical politics on, on climate change, and I by and large agree with them. But there, if you're going to deal with climate change at this point, um, not only do you have to take care of of uh, existing fossil fuel fairly quickly, uh, you also have to do carbon sequester. Uh, and unfortunately, most of the people who try to sell you carbon sequester are also people trying to get us not to change the <laughs> oil industry. But um, it is um, it, it is because of the compounding thing, something that we have to sell. That is a sacrifice we're going to have to take in investment and R and D. And this and the other, there's no reason to make everybody pay for it on the back end, though. Mm -hmm. Like, that's to me, that seems ridiculous. Um, it's like when you know, you live in, if, in certain progressive cities, you can buy greener fuel from your on your power bill, like you can opt to a more green power option. I, 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 I guess that it probably matters nary a whit to anything but your conscience and to someone's bottom line. And yes, you probably are getting more green power, whatever that means. Like you're getting more of your power supplied by. Although since I, I'm actually, since it's coming from a unified grid, it's it's because they're claiming offsets. I, that's happening. Oftentimes, they're... oftentimes, yeah. and also like let's not forget too that in the case of like the TVA, a lot of that stuff is being utilized to try to uh, chop up uh, that that system of you know a centralized democratic grid, which I think is like a, a very big threat and like. You know, that, that's that's one thing, again, that like I've been very you know adamant about. I, I don't have a problem with solar and wind. I think that they're great. Um, but the current system that we have right now promotes one type and it's privatized um, mm. and primarily residential installation, which is something that is accessible to a very certain segment of, of the population. And again, one of the other fears that has like cause me to become more invested in this question because i don't know i'll just like you know put my cards on the table here as as a leftist i was never very interested in in like climate policy other than just saying like i support the good climate policy and i'm against the bad climate policy you know um but lately i've been getting very worried about the current state of what the good policy looks like quote unquote um and trying to really reckon with what that means for building a kind of socialist future that i'd like to live in and what we're seeing right now, particularly in Texas, is after the winter storm, a huge boon in the you know residential solar industry, which is ununionized. Um, it uh, does not pay very well. It's extremely dangerous, um, and it's it's very predatory on 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 workers. Um, and again, it's a solution for a certain segment of the population, notably rich folks, um, that um, that pulls people out of politics. I mean, I didn't. I didn't put this in the piece because I felt a little weird about finding like a nice puff piece in the Houston Chronicle um, where some fellow was saying like, well, I realized that, you know, they're not going to do anything on the political level. So I decided that I'm just going to do something myself. Right. Which, again, I don't judge anybody or have any, you know, there's no problem with that necessarily. But again, you can see how that's a really depoliticizing uh, moment. And in a country with such wealth inequality. I really can see a future where you start to see these like completely untethered, um, you know, nice, clean energy for the rich folks who get to opt into that system and dirty, hyper expensive um, energy for, for the rest of us. Well, what we need to be doing is just like reclaiming and, and fighting for, you know, large scale centralized power systems that provide electricity to people, um, you know, cheaply affordably and ideally free right like but this is the way that it's it's going to go especially when the logic that governs this is this very neoliberal um fixation on um 
on, on, on the market, right? Where like, if we give enough tax credits to the solar industry, then, you know, people will um, put enough of them on their households, which again is like not the best solution to this because it's not really ideal for every house to have a solar panel when we could just be producing that electricity and bring it on, producing that electricity cleanly and bringing it on a, on a grid, right? Just resources, manpower, all the logistics that go into that. It just, is, it's, it's not the solution, but it is the solution of, you know, somebody who has like, feelings about climate change under neoliberal like capitalism, thinking of yourself as an individual or as a family. Right. And this is something that that is truly, truly um, worrying um, to me because I'm seeing it develop. And I'm sorry, friend, and like in a place like Texas, where like you, you're supposed to take responsibility for your own life, you can definitely see that that's going to suck up a lot of the energy and frustration that people are having with the failing system instead of directing that towards a more democratic political movement to, to change that system at, as a whole. This is important, and I think it's important that we really think about this in a couple, of, a couple of ways, because I think you're absolutely right that removing this from politics is a huge problem. I think it's also important that a side effect, and this is, this is, this is a, a, a pernicious side effect that we've seen in other areas, um, is that it ex exacerbates micro differences within a class. So one of the things I fight against all the time, and, and I even might, my, is all this PMC talk. I do think there's a problem with liberal professionals overrepresenting both liberal and left policy. That's a real mm -hmm. thing. What I don't believe is the whole like. 40% of the population is unproductive labor as opposed to 13% in true blue collar labor, mm -hmm. um, which is actually one of the smarter articulations of this. Or um, let's fight a culture war and call it a class war because these liberals that I know in the PMC class are, are, are annoying, right? Um, and uh, look, everybody who's dealt with the liberals are annoying. But one of, the, one of the things I want to tie this back to is that is a function of the fact that the actual people in power, the high brokers of finance capital are so fucking far removed from people's lives and so removed from our ability to see them with the exception of jokers um, in the tech industry who are nouveau rich, like Elon Musk mm -hmm. and, um, and Jeff Bezos, that we literally cannot imagine that they still run society. Like, and that means we do not have solidarity between sectors of various classes that differences are quite small and i always talk about this when i was a kid right like i thought that people who made you know and i'm, I'm gonna adjust this for 90s money but i thought people who made seventy thousand dollars uh which is you know a significant amount over the 1990 average of thirty thousand mm -hmm. dollars um a year uh were super fucking rich and yeah, they're better off. Yeah, they're rich on a world scale in a real way. But like in the, in the annals of our class structure, no, they are not mm. really that rich. They do not really have that much power. And um, they, you know, it's just something you can see. Well, if you make if you make these consumption choices like that, a couple of things start happening. One, and I'm going to use organic food because that's what I think is like, you know, Good, clean, organic food. Well, what do we associate good, clean, organic food with? Hippie woo and rich people. All right. Yeah. All right. Our, our upper middle class people, actually. like, um, But in the colloquial sense, rich people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Which means now we've turned a good that would be good, could be produced for everybody, into a class distinction marker. We People are now paying for the privilege to, to have their conscience assuage, which also makes the idea of cleaner production now a class con conscious and social capital marker that it did not used to be. So having a conscience becomes, itself becomes a form of conspiracious consumption, which also leads to bullshit like acting like you don't have an environmental consumption as a way to stick it to the people who are slightly richer than you. And mm -hmm. I remember bullshit trends like coal rolling uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, and stuff like that. I mean, admittedly, most of that stuff is both terribly expensive and doesn't last very long, but you have, it turns these things 
into cultural signifiers between different sectors of the class who have who might actually also have real material odds with each other but are not the primary battle for which we mm -hmm. should be fighting and unfortunately i think this even sucks socialist into this because now there's this weird like uh uh, anti PMC pro PMC thing on the left that just it's just like no this is and, we have lost the we've lost the fucking narrative like and yeah no I mean and I totally agree like I do I do think that like there's value in like reckoning with and being able to investigate some of like like the original conceptions of like what the PMC is but I I do agree with you so much friend that like. <laughs> I mean, the culture war in America is just so strong that we can take anything and we can, you know, embed that in, in, in the web there. I mean, from going back to an earlier example, like the natural gas pipelines versus the wind, right? Like that wasn't really a material thing. That was just like, what side do you want to be seen as being a part of, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 I totally um, agree too that the, like the left is really, um, the left, again, I think you probably share my same frustration with sometimes talking too broadly, but like a lot of people in the circles that I run in, like there is a hyper fixation on, on the PMC stuff. And a lot of it, as, as you're saying, is like, yeah, it's cultural signifiers um, and is also something that could be imported as it already is um, into a right wing critique or a right wing narrative. Right. Like those guys like the Vances and, and the Hollies are very comfortable. They might not call it PMC, but they're they like to signal to a very similar kind of dynamic that like, yeah, I totally agree. A lot of those that, that mentality and there is this like the downwardly mobile class and it, it, it entering into the working class and like it brings its own kind of weird proclivities and things like that but that's not the root <laughs> cause of the issues that we're having and it's it's something that i think as as marxists we need to be much more careful about because you're replacing cultural social analysis with like class analysis right um or even even fixating so much on like income is, is in the sense of like dollars and cents versus like your relationship uh, to production, I think is, you know, a, a big mistake that like the PMC stuff has sort of overwhelmed in a lot of people's minds instead of like learning to do some, you know, real class analysis, understanding your like position in a social system um, that produces things. People are very fixating. It's like, well, you know, they have this kind of attitude towards stuff. Um, which again, I think is a good critique to make in, in the political sense of like, how do we make things attractive and how do we build coalitions and how do we win arguments and things like that? I, I think that there's certainly a role for that kind of stuff, but I do agree that like, it sucked a lot of people into just doing culture war politics with the veneer of, you know, socialism or leftism. Yeah. Well, I mean, I know a lot of people used to complain about who are leftists used to complain about the libs who just blithely moved back over to complaining about the PMC when, when the concept was resurrected from the new left in the in the seventies, and I actually do think it's important to understand those other conceptions of class. And but I also say, like, you also have to understand they were written about in America in Fordism and in yes, a European I'd social totally democracy. Agree. It's actually a completely in a time where people assumed that the primary contradictions of capital between bourgeois and worker were over, <laughs> mm -hmm. like. Nobody assumes that now because that if you said that as the premise, uh, we'd know two things about you. Either you were a right winger or you were insane. Like, I mean, like, because I'm yeah. like, oh, so you think the bourgeoisie doesn't exist? Like, um, I do admit though, I think part of the problem of this, and uh, um, Matt Crispin's actually pretty good on this, um, uh, is that the structural or ownership of capital does make this harder to parse out because there's a lot of capitalists who technically draw a wage for something, but actually mm -hmm. mostly live off of their, their investment stock. And there are a lot of workers who, about 40% of workers actually, who, because they have a 401k, have a tiny sliver investment into capital. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, they may own a home, which also com completes their relationship to property ownership, even though it's not productive property. And theoretically, since most people have debt on it, they don't really own it. Um, mm -hmm. This, it leads to kind of a dual problem. And I can see where people would be like, well, that's part of why the class consciousness is muddled. But I, I hate to tell people that even places that, are, that don't have these issues, a lot of the class consciousness is still muddled. Um, totally. 
I, I, I'm just curious what you think about this. And I don't have like a proper thesis or something written out, but it's something that I, I see a lot on, on the left where, I mean, you, especially when you do, when, when you argue with folks, like I think some people forget like the, the theoretical like utility of like the working class under like a Marxist analysis, right? Which is that these are the people who produce the things that we need in society. And there's a class that sits above them and extracts and enjoys like the, the value and wealth that that creates. Um, and yes, so they're exploited and like, we should feel bad about that on a moral level. But the real crux of it is that, you know, as, you know, as Marx notes that like, the point of that is not just that workers are the most necessarily exploited people in history, like under a capitalist system. It's not necessarily true that they are the most exploited person in their society, just be, just on the very nature of you being a worker. But because of that r crucial role in production, you have the ability to shift and change that that system. Right. Right. And I think what a lot of people on the left do, and it really frustrates me. And this isn't like an argument against like feeling morally outraged about the abuses that we do in this country to powerless people. But they sometimes mistake that agent of like change in history for instead of like looking at it systematically, like where are the people in production, what powers do they have and where are we starting to see potential avenues for shift or change coming from that to how can I find like the most exploited or most abused person in our society and also globally? And it creates a lot of weird pathologies that I, I, I see a lot on the left, right? Where there's like a fixation on like, oh, American workers have it so good compared to, you know, somebody who is a subsistence farmer um, in South America, right? And it's like certainly true on some levels, but like, what does that actually mean to you politically? I mean, frankly, you're not making a political argument here. You're just telling me how we should feel about different people and you get what i mean like and, and that's something that i think that comes from a disconnect when you aren't actually engaged in like the work of politics but you actually become more of like a passive viewer of politics and history and take a little bit of personal pleasure in the fact that like you're the one you know who's figured it out which again look i'm a guy who you know i, I studied philosophy in college like i like to you know sit around and think about things and debate with folks um but like that's not the point of this at the end of the day and i think that that is a like a huge pathology, particularly in the American left, um, that one um, is bad because it's not giving us good analysis for doing something about it. Um, but it also is like very anti-solidarity based um, in its in its um, in, in, in its practice, because it's not really something that you get from like socialist movements um in other countries like you know like our friends in moss in bolivia they're not they like they want there to be a socialist movement in america they're not somebody who would be like well american workers are privileged globally so like they shouldn't have like yeah, a working class movement third world in this country. is actually it's not a, it's not non-existent in the third world as some people will claim but it's actually whatever that is actually because three worlds decent what's included in the three worlds has shifted around and one of them doesn't exist uh, one of the other whole world groups doesn't exist anymore so like it's 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 it, it, who knows what it means like we don't talk about the second world anymore um the the uh the whole thesis there to me is 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 muddled in solidarity and it comes out of a frustration usually from people frankly not having masses of people immediately glom onto their ideas Mm -hmm. And trying to come up with a with a post hoc class justification, so that so that it's not a moral justification. And this bugs me. This is a trait we've seen in the left. It, it isn't totally unique to America. It also happens in France and England, um, but it is kind of unique to let's say the historical cores of capital. Um, mm -hmm. And it's maddening to deal with i mean <laughs> yeah. one of the things that I, I always tell people you know yeah i this is a controversial statement but as far as like my subjective experience i would much rather be a peasant in rural mexico than a proletarian in i in northern mexico which is richer are in parts of the united states all mm. right uh because at least in rural mexico i have social supports there are traditions in which I can live in. And now there's a way to romanticize that. Like, there's not enough hospitals. You will die of shit that you won't die of. But 
having lived in all three of those areas and dealt with all three of those classes of people, I can tell you some of that is projection. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, the, and the other thing is a lot of immiseration is relative to where you're at. Like, yes, the infrastructure. And I actually have to remind people this, this is even true within the United States. Like, I have told people, and I, people got mad at me, but, and I'm like, this is not too slight Californians or New Yorkers, but the infrastructure is such that unless you're homeless, are completely shut out in California and New York, in which case things are very shitty for you. Um, there are certain things that you have access to that if you're a poor person in the South, you can't even dream of. Like, mm. it's, it's not a possibility. Um, and a lot of the response I get. Um, it's, well, they should come to New York. And then I'm like, well, or California. And I'm like, well, if that happens, two things are going to happen. Your prices are going to go up because we live in, an, in a capitalist society. And uh, that's how that works. And you're going to have more homeless people. Do you want that? Like, because yeah, that's what you would lead to. like. And also, like, the the continued destruction of, of, of those regions, too, right? Where you just see, I mean, moving across the country... I mean, I know that's becoming like a big part of most people's life uh, under under the system of, of American capitalism. But I mean, it could be incredibly alienating to be away it's from, alienating. you know, close family and community support and things like that. It's like, expensive. That, like it's very expensive. <laughs> like, I, like, um, as a story I like to point out, it was cheaper for me to move to another country than to move to different parts of the United States when I needed <laughs> to get out of Georgia. True facts. Like, wow. yeah, like uh, because I could get more aid to move to another country. I don't mean like Europe. Like I was going to. Uh, to East Asia and then to like um, mm. quote, quote developing world countries but like it's still it's it's a way better skill whereas like moving to Pennsylvania was prohibitively difficult like it was just yeah. it was just it, it's funny when people throw that out um, it actually tells you a lot about their relative social standing but even that all right uh, I, I think this is really anti-solidaristic. And I think a lot of people right now are very frustrated. And these are ways that they want to cope with this. One of the things I like to point out with me, no, Marx is not the answer to everything, but you want to read Marx, what he says when people ask about income and, and the proletariat, like he literally basically laughs at it, um, you know, in the critique of the growth program, like that's not our concern. And in so much that it is our concern, like we can only deal with it after we've had a revolution and after we started reorganizing society because in the current it's it, it you literally have no way to deal with this with this inequality and just asking for stuff like equal compensation or fair compensation yeah, actually yeah. won't fix it either so to totally and like i mean just like one more piggyback off of like this weird i mean it's almost like you're sitting there waiting you know, to be let into heaven or not, right? It's like, how, you know, the way a lot of American leftists try to do this this game, which is, again, it's just like, it's, it's not the point of, of, of this movement to decide upon who's got it the worst. It's the point of the, the idea of, of like Marxism and socialism as a political movement is to make things better sub substantially for everybody. Um, but beyond that, what gets me frustrated about like, oh, the baubles of living in America versus another place, it's like, well, you know, the irony is like you start to actually sound like a libertarian um, who makes these arguments that like because you can get strawberries at the grocery store and like that was something that was maybe hard to do in like, you know, medieval Europe uh, on a regular basis, like you somehow are living like a great life, completely ignoring like the social dynamic of being exploited by your boss and and the system and like it's just it's a weird pathology and i've just been rubbing up against it more and more lately and trying to figure out a way to to break out of it because um i think i, I think you're right about talking about third worldism but i actually find a lot more of it to be less like theoretical in the sense of like it's imported from like you know a kind of marxist pessimism that's sort of turning towards like some interpretation of maoism to stuff that's sort of brought over from the fact that a lot of people on the U.S. left came from liberalism to Bernie Sanders to socialism in a very short period of time. Oh, yeah. And there's not a lot there's not a lot of political education that goes along with that. So they're attracted by the ideas of socialism standing up for like, you know, the people who have been stomped on by the system, etc. Um, but there's not enough of a, of a working through 
why beyond it just being something moral that should make your you know stomach turn why that's actually like a problem of a system that is riddled with contradictions that we should be abolishing and building something different right and i mean as somebody who does you know talking um like this i i try to always make remember to meet people where they're at but i i, I i've been sort of puzzled at the best way to get through it because i'll just admit that i just get really personally angry um listening to people just sort of go on and on and on about this stuff when it's not directed at anything substantial or significant critique that has like a political movement uh, behind it it's just a sort of saying like well this is a way that i'm going to say that, like these people aren't pure or good enough for my like care or solidarity right which i think is just a very unhelpful way to try to build a movement that is going to be able to overcome one of the most entrenched systems um ever yeah, I I think a lot about this problem, and I don't know. Part of me thinks that we have the wrong subject, and, and this this may actually I might sound a lot like these like these uh, anti PMC people, but um, that the left is not the subject I am ultimately concerned about, even though I'm constantly in dialogue with it, even though I know that ideas that would be helpful for the working class are going to emerge out of the left, you know, and the left does have working class people in it, but you can't one-to-one -one ever claim. And honestly, at no time in history, it's not just mm. now, could you ever claim that the left and the working class were exactly the same thing? Totally. Um, although one of the fascinating things, uh, when this comes out, there'll be an interview on the Cardona's in Chile. And despite the fact that uh, most of the political identification of the uh, workers um, in Chile during the Allende was not the the Socialist Coalition or the or the or the Popular Unity Group, uh, and it was not the far left like the uh, the 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 Guevarist. It was the Christian Democrats, mm -hmm. but their actual policies and programs were as radical or more radical than what Allende was asking for in the Cardona system, which tells you that, that this political identification can sometimes be mystifying. Um, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't actually tell you as much as you think it does. I mean, you know, I always bring out the studies and say, yeah, the most poor people are, Demo most very poor people are Democrats if you make under $50,000 a year. But then most Democrats are actually the are, are the most well off people in the country. Totally. Um, and they live in the richest areas, too. Um, ironically, a lot of the poorest people also live in those areas. Um, the the Republicans are a fairly rich party and have a bunch of millionaires. But on aggregate, they tend to be petite bourgeois are downwardly mobile, formerly privileged workers. If you mm. want to get really. But even that, if you if you try any person that you meet may not actually fit that bubble. Like these are these are statistical aggregates. And those are changing a lot. The one thing that I can say, for example, while there's still loyalty of the urban poor to the Democratic Party in so much that they vote and most don't, um, uh, the Democrats are getting richer on average, mm -hmm. like every election totally cycle true. for the last three decades. So and that's actually worrying in a lot of ways. Um, uh, now, for me, who is skeptical of Popular Front stuff, I, I'm like, well, this should tell you what we have to do, which is be very cautious when we work with Democrats and never throw our lot completely behind them. Totally. But um, uh, it is, it's, it's going to be, it, it's interesting because I think people then, and I've heard people say this, I listened to, an academic in 2000 say, well, the white working class hasn't voted for progressives since the 60s. They've betrayed us. It's all racism, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, in aggregate, the white working class doesn't vote, but neither does the black working class, neither mm -hmm. does the Latino working class, neither does the, does the Asian working class. Um, and frankly, a lot of Trump supporters, I think uh, Clive Barrow actually was pretty good on this, um, also probably don't vote they probably didn't even vote for him which is no i think, think that's about. very true <laughs> um <laughs> so it's it's it, it, it it's a weird dynamic in which we, we we play this out and then we look at the policies well 
one of the things I have noticed in the last decade is while you can't, there's a lot of popular reports of some fairly progressive policies in California. Um, there, so I don't want to totally shit on them again. We give we give credit to where it's due. Like we Gavin love our Newsom, brothers and sisters from California. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah uh, Gavin Newsom doing stuff about uh, producing insulin is a godsend. I don't know why the federal government isn't doing it. Mm-hmm. But well, as Pete Buttigieg says, the government doesn't do that. Right. Yeah. Whatever. Um, <laughs> the government does do a lot of that stuff anyway. But um, but and, and there's another sense though in which like I this whole ad that knew someone uh, ran in Florida. Um, mm, I see it, that. Yeah. And uh, I'm thinking this only works if you already agree with Democrats. So totally. it might work as a primary move. It's It doesn't speak to anyone in Florida because even if they wanted to come, like even as a Southerner, if I want to come to California, I can't, I personally, all right, I'm not poor. I personally cannot afford to move to California. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I like if I was to take a teaching job there, there's no way for me to make enough money to live in any area of which I would have access to the stuff that I I need. And mm-hmm. if I lived in rural California, it's just as batshit as rural Texas. In fact, sometimes it's actually worse. Um, and so it's. This this whole neoliberal self responsibility logic, I think you're right to point out, it pervades the left in ways we don't even really see when we talk this way, when we side with democratic policymakers this way, when we like even in the way we throw insults around. Like one of the weirdest insults on Twitter for a while was to call people settlers, and I was like, <laughs> unless you're an indigenous person, in in your area, and I actually I would include most countries. That are not typically thought of as settler colonial countries do have settler colonial portions of their country. Uh, you are probably a descendant of a settler. Calling someone that personally is a useless insult. Like they didn't do it. It's true as a historical category. It's a necessary thing to understand about the development of capital. It's a necessary thing to understand about the development of racial politics. But it absolutely is meaningless when applied to individuals. Um, who are descendants of things that happened 300 years ago. Mm. Like, and so what does that tell you? It tells you we have moralized and essentialized analytic categories and confused them with moral ones. And totally. That, in and of itself is anti solidaristic. And also, it misunderstands the categories too. It, it's actually not just moralism, it also makes it hard to use the analytical tools to which those categories originally came out of to do anything. Yeah, I mean, this is like one of the the big frustrations that, I mean, or more importantly, questions that we have, like with building a, a winning movement in, in the left, which is this way, I think, you know, a bit of a failure in doing real political education with people in, in the movement at large, where um, we're not learning things for the purpose of like... <laughs> bettering each other and like you see another thing i uh, not to direct this so much online but this is where you see these debates happen i think there's a reason for that because talking this way face to face doesn't really work out too well yeah (laughs) um but like you know there's there's all one that also does me crazy is like the theory thing i'm sure you as an educator probably get really annoyed with this which is like oh all these people they say the solution to the problems is just to read theory like they're just yelling read theory at workers of like how absurd that is it's like well one no one in their right mind is doing like this incredible story that you're putting forward like some guy just outside of a workplace being like read theory um and two it's i always go back i have not to plug too much of my own stuff but when I used to do videos for Jacobin, um, I did a video called political theory is for everyone um, where I used an example that I think would speak to some of the people who make this like don't read theory or whatever argument um, using Fred Hampton. And there's this really great kind of found footage of Fred Hampton sitting um, at a meeting of the, the Black Panther Party, and he's handed a proposal to create a community bank. Right. Um, you know, that would be owned by the, the people for you know the purposes of giving people access to finance in a highly segregated uh chicago um to help them out but in the piece there was no political education 
um, section of the proposal. And Fred Hampton takes them to task for this and reminds them that, like, you know, you can have whatever intentions that you want going into this kind of thing. Um, but if you don't understand why we're doing the thing that we're doing, you are also setting yourself up for the potential of undoing it in the future. Right. And he brings up the example of like, if people don't understand, like, this is our bank, this is our money, this is like to help us out, then you're going to see people finding ways maybe to trim a little bit off the top to take, you know, to give themselves some extra money. Cause like, if you don't have a very strong connection with the political movement, even if it's successful, or ideological understanding of the political movement, even if it's successful, if you're not really well versed as to why you're doing the things that you're doing, like you, you could very well undo those things um, in the future. And he goes through some examples of like Papa Doc in Haiti. It's a very fun little clip. But like these are really important things for us to wrestle with that like it's not just enough and going like, um, you know, going on what I was saying about the climate change stuff. Right. At a certain point, it's not just enough to expect us all to like be doing the right thing. We also need to be understanding what it is that we're doing and why. Um, and I think that that's really, really missing from a lot of people's understanding because we are in such a defeated position where it would just be great to get a bunch of people showing up to a meeting and maybe doing something collectively. If we don't understand the strategies um, that we're doing, one, we can undermine them. And two, you don't want to be in a system, a political movement, where you have a bunch of people at the top who understand everything and then a bunch of people in the base of the organization who have no real understanding of like the strategy and, and what we're doing for the sense of like being able to make real critique of that. Or, you know, like these things are, are, are really, really important. And like they're democratic necessities is to have a, a very well educated a member of any kind of movement and certainly a, a, any kind of society. Um, and this weird pushback that we get from some people on, on the left to this very serious need um, is ridiculous, especially when you remember how a historical it is that like almost every successful socialist movement in history has had not only a very vibrant political education part as a part of membership and an organization, but also public education in the sense of, you know, increasing literacy, science education, all these kind of things, right? Like these are cruxes of the socialist movement. And I don't know why there's this pathology on the U.S. left right now to act like those things are bad um, or keep people out. Yeah, I mean, it's it's maddening to deal with in a lot of ways, and it's also maddening to figure out, like, when people throw out the theory, all right, and I, I actually, one of the things I tell people now is, like, I will always give you infinite things to read. I am a, I am a gifted reader because I was traumatized in grad school, and I can read 100 books a year, and I will tell people that there are two ways to do that. Um, if you're not in school, one is to read very fast and not sleep. That's my way. And the other way in the more common way is to be rich. Right. <laughs> and because I realize most people don't have my way and are not rich, they cannot read all this stuff. They should read what they can and what they enjoy and what they want to know about. Right. So when I say all the unique theory knowledge, I am not telling people to just spend all their time fucking reading books. And I'm totally. going to actually say, if you don't apply the theory in anything other than academic papers, looking at some of my friends here, then you have rendered the theory actually somewhat useless. Because let's be honest, one, the average person, fuck, the average academic actually doesn't read 99.9% .9 of the research in their own field because um, there's too much of it. Um, and so the average person is never even going to hear about it. And a lot of these things also have frameworks and jargon. Some, some of the jargon is even necessary because you have to be specific in the way you talk about the stuff. It's not all just academic terrorism um, mm -hmm. that alienates people without a lot of background. Um, however, conversely, though, there's two assumptions in, in the thing that you're talking about that bugs me. One is that, quote, disadvantaged people can't understand this shit they might not have totally. high reading capacities i mean like you, you, when you remember when capital was written marx thought it was written for workers it has untranslated greek in it and like 50 percent of the workers weren't literate like you know like but mm. what people would do and i think people misunderstand this part of the function of socialist movements education unions is the literate person would read it at a union meeting yep and then they figure out how to apply it and if and it could be applied 
and like i think that this gets again like i'm not a teacher like you so um you know i i don't have like a unified theory of pedagogy or anything like that but i do think as you know a movement member socialist that like collective reading of things is a really great way to go about this right where you're reading things in a group and you're discussing it um because one you know just on like a basic level it's like it can sometimes be helpful when you realize that other people were struggling with this bit of it and two you're going to have a much better understanding in, in my opinion at least like a much better of uh, a, a conception of, of a piece when you're hearing all the things that other people are bringing into it versus just sort of reading it solo right and like this point is like you know these things I, I hope we're not going, you know, too deep on like, you know, rabbit trails or anything like that. But um, again, like it's it's just this pathology of assuming the absolute worst intention behind these things, because the point isn't gatekeeping. It's actually collectively understanding things and building up an understanding that can move into something like a program um, or, you know, in, in, into action. And like that's going to come out very well from collective education projects um much more than like sort of reading these things in kind of isolation but i mean this is a pervasive like weird little uh you know twitter tirade thing that that i see from time to time but you, you see it come up a lot and i uh, i think that your point one is like the assumption that people aren't gonna be able to wrestle with these things um is is you know is incorrect and insulting and two that like there are also plenty of other ways to be educated and to be versed in these things than just like the act of like I personal isolation reading you know on on your couch right like i think that those things would be very very good especially in a society that's as atomized and isolated as we have right now if we took all the people who are very interested in this stuff and they were working through these things collectively rather than everybody coming into conversations from completely different traditions and understandings. I mean, I mean, just like as, as you do, uh, you know, when I watch your show, like you're very adamant about making sure that we're defining terms. And I think that's very important, um, not just for the clarity of the conversation, um, but if we're all operating from different understandings of these things, we're going to talk past each other the entire time. Um, and you know, that happens so fucking much, uh, particularly in left media, um, that, you know, I think that that's a very important thing to be able to do as well. Yeah. I think there's a whole lot to, to be learned here about how you interface. And, and I have a theory about why we are this way. There's two, there's two, there's two larger social imperative questions we have to think about. Uh, so a lot of the left, whether we like it or not, since the 1960s, since the advent of the new left, is formally educated because a lot of the workforce is formally educated. And I think that's an important point that you make. 40% of the workforce, you need some kind of credential to be... Actually, 40%... Actually, it's more than that. It's 40% of the workforce and 40% of people have a BA or higher. Um, and I think something like 60% of work requires something. However, I've also been pointing out lately, that's reversing because of a bunch of very complicated trends, including the baby boomers finally leading the market. Like, mm -hmm. like the baby boomers have been... Eat I, mean, I don't want to blame them for stuff because this is not their fault entirely, but like, it's a very large generation. It It's historically super rich as a generation cohort. That is misleading, though. To apply it to any individual again don't moralize mm -hmm. this on down to the person or to your mom um which is uh, unfortunately a lot of the writing about this does it too so when i mention this a lot of like older people think i'm like blaming them and i'm like yeah it's general and sometimes yes i i do feel that way i mean because i'm pissed off but but ultimately no i don't really think it's like the individual baby boomer isn't stealing from their kids it's not even it's not something they collectively decided to do as a generation it's something that was incentivized early on, um, but they all left the they left the market during COVID for the most part, and now there's all this space. There's also less immigration, global uh, globalized supply chains are really breaking mm -hmm. down, et cetera, and so forth. So you have a lot of pressures there. Um, it's interesting to think about that uh, in terms of this education problem, but let's bracket that back out for a second. Most of the left is formally educated, even the parts that isn't. One of the interesting things about the downwardly mobile trend of overproduction of academics, particularly in the 90s and the aughts, is where did they find jobs? Well, they didn't really find jobs, but where they found part-time employment 
and things like advertising, media, uh, research, public outreach, stuff that uses social media. And then social media itself is all about mm -hmm. tying social capital with dopamine addiction. So those two things function on a competitive basis that is anti-solidaristic in nature. And that includes in academia. So because an academia's primary function, whether people want to admit it or not, is not the embedderment of society. It's not even research. It's primary function in regards to what capital cares about it. Um, then we have to remember academia is a pre-capitalist institutional set that has been cap that has been made to fit in a capitalist worldview. Um, what capital cares about is basic R and D research, and that's where you don't have a lot of comp like that's where competitions more really is meritocratic. And the rest of it's, uh, well, can you prepare our workforce? Sort it for me. And so mm -hmm. everything you do becomes a social competition, and it really shows up. And older academic practices where like grades are like grades were set on a curve. You had to produce a bell curve. You weren't grading people based on an absolute standard. You were mm -hmm. grading people based on a relative standard because that's what elite employers cared about. Were they able to tell that you were giving them the cream of the crop? So those two things inherently breed anti-solidaristic action. And then you add to the fact that a lot of left organizations once they decoupled from unions needed cadres that had a lot of free time who has a lot of fuck ton of free time. Mm -hmm. I know it didn't feel that way until you enter the workforce, but students do totally. And so that's why our norms of our culture, I think are so fucked up because mm -hmm. our culture comes out of this one, two punch of academia and social media. Now, the social media problem is true for the right, too. And they have some of the same problems about that. But the academia problem is not. And mm -hmm. so, for example, I think people think the right is super unified. And as we talked, and I actually noticed a lot of people thought that in your comments on your show when I appeared there. Um, it's absolutely not. But it understands, it understands insider, outsider infighting better. So... Mm -hmm. So rightists fight each other brutally. Like, I mean, and sometimes literally kill each other. And luckily, this between nations is one of the reasons why they haven't taken over the world. But because different kinds of nationalists ultimately can't really get along. But uh, when push comes to shove, they there is a, I don't want to say solidaristic, but it's kind of what it looks like. They know how to reform solidaristically. Mm -hmm. We don't. Like, we do not stop fighting each other when we are being attacked. Totally. So, yeah. and in that, there might be all kinds of reasons for that. I've been trying to figure that out for years, like why that is, like what about left culture? Make, and it's liberal culture too, actually. Oh, for um, sure. Uh makes mm -hmm. that so difficult like why is that what why is that strategic switch so hard um and i say this as a person again i'm, I'm skeptical of the popular front but i do believe in united front politics and, and by that i mean we state our differences and we hold to our lines but mm -hmm. on an important issue you get the issue done yeah and and you get over your shit and and that is important and I just do, by and large, our culture does not encourage that. And the only thing I can figure is what I said about the one-two punch of us coming out of first academia, unfortunately, and then social media when we weren't as wedded to academia. Um, because there was a real sense in which if you were a leftist, you didn't really encounter these things until the internet, mm -hmm. um, unless you mm -hmm. were in a university. Because that's where it was curtailed to pretty much after the 70s. Um I mean, yes, there is still like if you're in a major city, you would still meet some old, like, you know, I met old trots every now and then at, at stuff but, and old malice. But they're re they were really, really rare. And they mm -hmm. even and even 10, 15 years ago, they were all in their 70s and 80s. Most of them are dead now. So it's like it's you see this trend here. And then the other thing that happens, and I want your thought on this, is because because of this hostility, this like. 
I think what a lot of people are reacting to when they say don't give us theory is what I'm talking about, actually, this whole academicization of it, because they don't see theory outside of that. Um, they don't see it as like a weapon that you use to understand how to do things. And, and I want to always tell people, there are other theories, and they weaponize this way, and you don't hear libertarians bitching about the difference between theory and practice <laughs> like, mm-hmm. um, in the same way we do. Uh, they argue with each other and are, are, are actually libertarians are kind of irrelevant now. Um, conservative nationalists have this, uh, religious people have this even like there's, there's a real sense of which theology is basically religious versus theory. Um, that people don't, people don't put the fake divide in the same way because the tension I think is the tension isn't quite as obvious. Like people know the point of theology in theory and in theory anyway is to get you to lead a certain life. Well, the point of theory is to give you the analytical tools to do certain things. If mm-hmm. the theory doesn't produce those tools, then you should probably throw it out. But people get really invested in the theory too. I mean, that's another, um, I, there's, I've, I've done like 50 things with you at once, but there's, there's so much going on here. Well, I mean, uh... I think one thing that I've seen that's been really positive on this, just like in the movements on the left, particularly like DSA over the past five years, again, not perfect, lots of contradictions in in the organization, things like that. And we're nowhere near where we would like to be. But some of the weird pathologies that sort of I felt like were imported from liberalism that were sort of dominant in the organization are still there. And there's people who cling to them very hard. But those have started to recede a bit as people have to do the work of knocking on somebody's door <laughs> and talking to the public or interacting in politics in like a real way versus just like, again, as I was saying earlier, like how should you feel about something? Right. And moving in, it is like, what can we do about this? Right. And I do see that like a lot of those tensions in the left, I think are products of the fact that like, well, if there is no external fight, you know, it's, and you have a lot of energy and care because leftists like, you know, it's not like the most fun thing to like be really into, you know, reading about like the exploitation of, of people around the world today and throughout history. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're very motivated people. They care deeply and that's a good thing. Um, but, you know, if you're not feeling like you have like the avenue or the outlet to have those those fights and, you know, use that energy towards politics or, you know, changing things, it is going to come internal very quickly. And it certainly was doing that in a lot of left movements um, post the first Bernie run. Um And had serious damages, um, don't get me wrong. But I think because so many people had to go through that collectively, I think that there is a a, a bit of an allergy to some of like the worst aspects of this, you know, kind of like hyper individualistic, moralist, like liberal perspective that was coming to the socialist movement. And it gives me a lot of hope, um, you know, for the future on that, where it's like, I mean, I would love it if we could just write like the great essay or, you know, put out the best interviewer debater on these things that would, you know, condemn them to to history. Um, but more often than not, it's just one of those things that I've just learned to accept. Like you can do as much pushback as you want and hopefully that will stop it from causing damage. But a lot of these things, like they have to be worked out in the sense of like people engaging in politics and seeing how like, oh, certain organizing strategies or certain ways of like debating with each other aren't very productive for maintaining, a, a, you know, an organization. So, uh, you know, it's one of those things where it's just like sometimes like the antidote has to be action. And just if anything, to to learn which things work and which things don't, uh, you know, obviously you want to go in with the best strategy and tactics and things like that. Um, but there's nothing that there's nothing that settles those kind of debates better than failure. Yeah, well, this is why I tell people to join an org, even if the org is shitty. But I tell people that because, like, look, I want also people to know, like, if you if you go into a union, your union is more than likely going to be shitty. <laughs> like, yeah. it's it, it, it it's it, but it's super important that you do it. Uh, one, you need to know how to fight for your principles in a solidaristic fashion. And what I mean by that is, and I think leftists, unfortunately, there's a long tradition as to why, and there's some sectarian habits that we've had for a hundred, for, for over a hundred years. And I can't blame on the new left. It's been a long time that actually also don't help this. 
But if you've ever been in a union or a movement that has to do something, you know you have to deal with people who are fundamentally opposed to you, but you have a basic program of agreement. And if and and that basic program of agreement in something like a union, for all of its limits, theoretically, and when a union's functioning correctly, emerges out of the membership itself. Like, and then that your your continued membership is based on your belief in the program which emerged out of out of the vast majority of the membership and you might you, and you know you're not going to win on every single point and i actually also this is where i'm probably a little different than, say democratic centralist or whatever where i'm like you should state your disagreement and why but you got to know that okay so you didn't win everything but you agree with nine of those points mm-hmm. and the other side you agree with none of them or one of them come on it's yeah. And it's in your interest to work with these people and you have clear goals. And this is where this is where leftists really need to think. You have clear both long term and immediate gains. And this is one thing where I think people on the short left kind term, of long term program. Yeah. Yeah. And short term, long term games. Like I'm not when people complain about careerism on the left, I do think that's a huge problem, I say as I'm doing a podcast. Um, but I also think there's a real sense in which People have to be expected to gain immediate real-world skills, benefits, and advantages to join an organization. And why would we expect a political organization to be different from every fucking thing else, including church, that we do in life? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, I say this just because, like, I want people to realize this is also a dynamic in religious groups. It's also a dynamic in, like, you, you have immediate short-term and long-term goals. And you have immediate personal advantages. If people are sacrificing for something for everyone, they should also get something for that sacrifice. I know, you know, that everything can't be perpetually put off to the future or after the revolution or whatever. And and I think that is something people really need to understand because that is how you build organizations. That is how you get me. That is why, like, I have criticisms of mutual aid as charity, and if it's all you're doing, it's going to burn you out. My partner mm-hmm. did mutual aid for a while. She felt like over years that it just felt like charity or it became an NGO. Uh, but the reason why mutual aid is an important component of this is that immediate benefit and that immediate, and this is a part a lot of mutual aiders miss, skilling, because we're dealing with a lot of people who have been de-skilled. We collectively have these skills. Like, we should not need universities and new institutions to give us these skills. We might need them to give us the credentials. We might need them to do But we can teach each other a lot of these skills. Now, mm-hmm. the most advanced skills, no. We, we like, no, there's certain things. Like, I'm not going to teach someone to be a neurosurgeon in a couple of weeks in a socialist group. I understand that. That's not what I'm saying. But I can teach someone. I can teach someone from basic proficiency at a thousand things, and they will benefit from that. Mm-hmm. And so... And for me, that's part of these theory reading groups. But it's also as a teacher, and you know, the the thing that most teachers fail at in a public school system or in a, a secondary school is convincing the kids that they know something useful from what they learn. And I'll give you an example. And sometimes I get paranoid. I think this is deliberate, but like I get the same. I get the micro complaints. We can't do taxes and. Uh, know how to buy a house. And I'm like, actually, I've taught you everything you need to do both things. Because if I taught you tax law, you're not, it's going to change next year. You've wasted a bunch of time on something that you don't mm-hmm. need to learn. You're not a specialist in it. It's not going to help you. But I did teach you math and reading, which are the two things you need to do. And hopefully I taught you how to research and find the materials that you need and f- to do the basics and to learn when something's so complicated when you need to seek out additional help. Like, But mm-hmm. teachers often because they're so focused on curriculum and because the way it's structured, do not make that connection for their students. Conversely, socialists do not teach that not only are we building you to be better socialists and be better political actors, in becoming better political actors, we're hoping and becoming solidaristic political actors, you are also becoming better people now. Mm -hmm. And that is something I think we miss. Now, I don't think socialism is going to make us like all better and moral and like you, I actually get really, I, I am not an anti-moralist. I'm actually really concerned about virtue ethics. But when I talk about Marxism, I'm like, that stuff is, that, that is not my concern. The only moral claim I make in Marxism is exploitation is bad. That mm. is a moral claim. But 
Um, but I also make the claim it also doesn't work very well. So, yeah. uh, but but uh, most of my other mm-hmm. arguments are not moral because we don't all share a moral framework, right? Like even on the socialist movement, we don't all have the same moral oh, yeah, values. That's very true. And so appealing you, to morals won't work. No, I mean, it will, I mean, more than anything, I'd like trust me. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a very much, uh, you know, a moralist on an individual level. But I just think, um, in in politics right now, in, in the movement, I think that like we've we trended a little bit too far onto that side. But I want to throw in like one other thing that like, just like on the theory on like the question of like organizing, you're starting to see it with this like new kind of fetish um, amongst people who. Like, Apologies my back. Okay, um, is is this push uh, about spontaneity, spontaneity, right? Mm-hmm. And Sam Ginden, I don't know if, if you know him or, or a fan of his work, has a really good uh, piece in Jackman that just came out a couple of days ago. I can't remember the full title, but spontaneity is the, the buzzword there. Um, you know, really pushing back on this idea that like what we're seeing from um, Amazon and, and the Starbucks unions is like uh, an example as to why like we just need to embrace spontaneity in like the union movement in general. And Ginden, as is his typical fashion, runs us like, no, like the real work has to be done by collectives, by organizations. Um, and particularly like pushing back against this false notion that a lot of people have, for example, that the pushes that you saw in the thirties came out from like a collective waking up of everybody. Like, no, that came after like years and years and years of like, purposeful um, 40 years and three different institutions building before a lot of that stuff happened like totally and the fact that like a lot of the people who were engaged in that work were communists who were engaged in that movement for the specific goal of creating a strong labor movement in this country right and there's this like allergy that we get sometimes uh, to that work that um i, I think is, is extremely damaging one is going to notes that like you know to think that, um, for example, in the Starbucks unions in particular, that there isn't like a lot of union um, education that's being done in, in that work, is just flat out wrong. A lot yeah. of great organizers from the AFL-CIO have been helping. Um, in fact, the people who we've interviewed on our program who've been engaged in this work have noted like one of the most important things was when we decided to do this, we had somebody to call and they talked us through the process, the strategies, the tactics, the rules, all this kind of stuff, right? Um, you know, so it's not this just like pure spontaneity of everybody waking up and self-educating, but rather collective efforts to engage in these kind of things. Um, and, and I think that like we need to be much more comfortable with that role for socialists where like to use another Gindin quote, he like he, you know, he reminds socialists that like, you know, people need to stop being so timid in trying to engage in directing things. Not like running into a community and saying like, haha, I have like the 10 point plan of what you need to do. But remembering that like socialists as members of the working class are like the volunteerist um, members of the working class, the people who are going to spend time educating themselves and educating others on strategies and tactics and doing that kind of organizing. And remembering that it's important um, to have that kind of guidepost to build successful movements. Because this idea that one day collectively everybody's going to wake up and be right, um, or even maybe motivated by the right things, want the right things, but know the best way to achieve those things is just wrong. Yeah, um, it's not going to happen. Not I mean, and, it, 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 yeah, yeah. That's yeah. why. That's why, like immiseration theorists, like we all get poor enough and we just all become correct. I'm like, that's a recipe for having authoritarian right wingers all over us all the time. Like totally. Like that's you know, what that normally leads to. To be frank. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, that getting in pieces is, uh, is interesting because I've been pushing on years. I think the whole organizing spontaneity debate is a misunderstanding of Rosa Luxemburg. And yeah. um, and it's a misunderstanding. It's not even like, like I don't disagree with Rosa. I think people should actually read what Rosa said very carefully. Um, and two, I think people miss... The spontaneity, in so much that it's a thing, and I think we should stop thinking about it as a separate thing, happens because we have created the preconditions for it to happen. Yes. So, like, anything that seems spontaneous has either active, organized, or, or unfortunately, also, this is another trend, 
uh, accidental path dependent accretions. So those are your two options uh, that led to it. It didn't just automatically happen. There's no, you know, there's no like Marxian eschatology where the working class all of a sudden just realizes it's all on the same page because X thing happened. And I'm always trying to, to tell people about that because it leads people to things like, well, things are bad. Tomorrow's the revolution. And I'm like, yeah. what, have, what have you done? Things are bad. And did you lay the groundwork for us to make things, things have been better bad for a long time? You yeah, know? things have been bad for a while. And in other cases, and, and, and frankly, the aughts and the aught teens were in some ways, not the beginning, were in some ways good years for us. Um, uh, and in some ways we kind of blew them. Um, so, but in a way, maybe I go back and forth on whether I think it was something we had to do because, because we did need to like the idea that left and liberal are separate things in America and not, and it, that's not just some weird European way of speaking yeah, <laughs> is yeah. as finally penetrated the culture at large. When mm. I started on this journey to use very awful a uh, speak, but when I started uh, being a socialist, you know, 15 years ago, um, that was absolutely not the case. And like, even playing something like Love Me, I'm a Liberal from the 60s was alien to most people. They did no longer understood the context anymore. And that is not true now. So that's the net good. Like, um, and I'm not, you know, my worry now is more like what I like to call mere anti-liberalism is like people who start like we're leftists, but we just want to own, own the libs. And so we just reject it outright and we'll even make forays with rightists who totally are going to betray us mm -hmm. and kill us as soon as we're done. Like, and sometimes when I say kill us, people think I'm being joking. And I'm like, no, I've literally seen it and people died. Like, and like in other countries, I have seen this happen. And like, I, let's just put it this way. A lot of the Egyptian IS members that I kind of knew are no longer with us. All right. Because they, they made bad deals in two different, very suboptimal situations. And in situations where I don't know what their real options were, but like um, sometimes in, as things get hotter and when I tell people things are probably going to get hotter in America, like these things do have real consequences. And unfortunately, Two things happen when that happens. People either double down and become more insane, or, or they, um, or they have to get, or they have to get over a lot of their shit. But both things can happen, and I think right now what we're seeing a lot, a lot of the left post uh, 2019, 2020 Bernie is we're seeing the first stages of people like dealing with that loss, and then and then thinking, oh, well, Biden won at least, so things aren't as bad as they could have been, and then realizing, no, they are still just as bad and maybe maybe worse mm. because the accretions weren't about the president. Like, I mean, that was a dark time, friend. Yeah. I'll never forget getting into a, a fight with some of the folks at Novara Media mm -hmm. after in the early days of the Biden administration because they were trying to say, like, look, this shows that the left can work with, like, the, you know, the central the centrist, the center left, and end up getting big policy proposals because everyone was so excited because Biden had plans that had big dollar sign numbers attached to them. Uh, as if like that was, the, as if the end goal of left policy is just a large amount of social spending. Um, you only need to look at the military to see why that's not a good connection to make. Um, right. But, you know, there was, there was, yeah, just very strange, strange times. I think I haven't seen too much walking back from those people. I think there's a lot of just sort of hope that people forget the kind of weird exuberance that we saw um, or not in the Biden administration. Yeah, that was a, that that was dark and it was it was strange. Um, and it was strange in a lot of ways because a lot of people also thought we defeated the right. And I was like at the time, my thought was we defeated them for about six months. And mm. actually, a lot of stuff we've done is going to make it harder to know what they're doing because you just kick them off the internet. They're not going. It's like you realize that being kicked off the internet doesn't make you go away. Even losing access to your PayPal oh, account sure. doesn't make you go away. Um, and and then 
a lot of leftist frameworks that we we as Marxists or Marxian thinkers or, or socialists were beginning to wrestle with and critique. They even started getting critiqued by liberals actually around this time. And then as soon as that happened, right wingers started throwing CRT accusations at everything. And it was weird because I, I got into this weird, I was in this weird scenario because I'm a teacher and then I'm like, look, mm. I actually don't like a lot of critical race theory, particularly in its most popular form. Actually, I do think there's good stuff to be learned from Kimberly Crenshaw and whatnot, but but you know, Robin D'Angelo, that um, buy more books. Yeah, the only uh, way to beat white supremacy is to buy each addiction, uh, addiction, addiction, right. uh, addiction of my new book. <laughs> right. So it. So and so I. I and felt to ruin like, every Thanksgiving dinner that you <laughs> ever go to for the rest of your life. <laughs> right. Well, I do think when I saw that, I was like, "This is going to lead to some backlash." And then, and then when the backlash oh, yeah. came, I'm like, "Now I'm in a weird position." Because I know that people throwing CRT are using it to accuse any form of historical literacy of anti-racism of being this pernicious CRT thing. But then I hear liberals saying CRT is just anti-racism. Like, no, it's actually not. Yeah. And it's also, while it's totally true that it's super rare in education, it has been in educational trainings I have attended. Um, uh, it most teachers didn't take it seriously and thought it was silly until the right winger started attacking it. But it, it's, it's this weird feedback loop. And it was interesting because I'm like, we didn't realize, I think, uh, that we are saying shit in public. <laughs> and some of these theories, uh, some of their, some of the Mont Bailey claims that some of these people do some of these theories make in public are really confounding, but that's also equally easily weaponized by the right. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think it's really, I think that's been a dark, it's kind of led to a dark time because for the first time in a long time, the right's winning the culture war and, and there's a lot of perverse and weird incentives about that. So one of the things I've always talked about, as like evangelicals are such a small part of the general public now they've actually been declining in size for 15 years um that it would actually make political sense to start paying them off to keep them as a loyal base but to not continually bait them in the same way because there's not enough of them for the bait to be as movement of a large group of people and i was like that may lead to republicans finally letting people in the courts and stuff do what they want I totally uh, agree with that analysis. I made the same yeah. argument too. I totally agree with that. Yeah, because but everyone's now like everyone's like, well, the the, the religious rights for a surgeon, and I'm like, actually, no, they're a trapped bear and they bit our throat, like, yeah. like, <laughs> like, like, but no. they're still a trapped bear. We just now now we're bleeding. Um. <laughs> What's what scares me the most about like the right? I mean, I don't know. Maybe there's something else, but something that does scare me a lot is like James Lindsay and that whole scene. Um, mm -hmm. Because I think that's like the most explicitly proto, if not completely fascist um, structure that I've seen in, in, in a while. At least the people who he's sort of bringing on board. Um, because it's, it's, it's really um, frightening for me just because it has that kind of hallmark of, you know, successful fascism, which is like, it's pure irrationality. Um, where, you know, he can just stick, throw anything at like the postmodern, well, I can't remember what new neologism he's been putting out for the Marxist left now, but, um, you know, because it changes every couple of days, it seems. But like interacting with people who have really sucked that stuff up is some of the more frightening conversations that I've had, like in the regular, you know, just normal setting, like maybe at a bar or something like that. Like that yeah. is like escape from reality stuff. That is a precondition to start getting you to see your neighbors, your teacher, you know, your community as threats that need to be dealt with and and, and eradicated. And like he plays with that language a lot. Well, um, they, 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 when they started throwing grooming language at all teachers, I knew that that's where we were going. I totally like, agree. That was because there's nothing understandably so more hated than that kind of accusation. And that is a classic dehumanizing and again it's a made-up charge um right, well, yeah it well it, it does two things actually one one pernicious effect i want to talk about it as someone who's actually fought real groomers of children 
in the education uh, field. They're rare, but they do exist. Um, mm -hmm. This also weakens fighting that too. All right, yeah. because now the accusation that and and they know what they're doing because they they're using sexualized language and they're saying, oh, but you just grew up on the be Democrats. But I'm like, no, but you're you're but you are literally using the language that you attach to pedophiles and hebephiles and other abusers of the young. And mm -hmm. so, um, so you know what you're doing, even if you're just saying we're indoctrinating. You're not using the term indoctrinating. You're using the sexual term on purpose to deliberately confound people that thinking we're all grooming their kids. Um, and it's usually somewhere else. And it's usually, and you can, and they always can, like you have this lives to TikTok thing where you're always finding, uh, you know, some weirdo who does this stuff. And I shouldn't say weirdo. I, I shouldn't be very careful about that. Cause a lot of these teachers are actually probably totally miscontextualized, but the mm -hmm. actual quote uh, that mm -hmm. you'll get on that thing does sound like, Whoa. And I'm like, I teach in some of these, like one of these things happened in Davis County, the most conservative county, a county, by the way, that has banned the use of the word bias from its Jesus curriculum. Christ. Yeah. Um, and it's constantly in civil rights lawsuits fights. Uh, that That's where a bastion of woke teachers that they found one of these lives a TikTok quotes on and the teacher quit. Um, she didn't even, uh, she didn't even get fired. She quit before she, she could. And I'm like, that's so decontextualized and rare, um, but it's presenting it as, as it's super common. And mm -hmm. I have literally, in 15 years of teaching and working even with explicit social justice advocates, never seen that. Not once. All right? Um, I am not saying that some of those quotes are fake or that stuff is made up. I actually don't know. I mean, I, I don't, those, like with any of those kinds of clips or like anything you see from Project Veritas, it's so decontextualized and hard to know what's been chopped up and butchered and what's actually real that that you you really don't know what they're doing. Um, I will say I have a as a, to get on this kind of thing. The one debate, you know, I don't debate people. Uh, ben Burgess and I disagree about that pretty profoundly. Um, I well, I'll debate people, but only if we share eighty percent of a worldview. I think debating with people who are completely outside of my worldview is not always useful. Um, because you just talk past each other. But the, the one debate that I actually thought he shouldn't have done was the James O'Keefe debate because I'm like, you don't debate, you don't debate people who are liars. You just don't. Like you do not do that. Like if you, you know someone is a is has been caught being publicly misleading more than twice and in a deliberate manner, you do not debate them. You just don't. Because like um well, now I think I mean, Ben handled it well, but that's I wouldn't have done it. I mean, I got to give Ben a, a hell of a lot of props just on a personal level for going into a room of, of dweebs like that. And literally every single time he opened his mouth, just booze <laughs> echoing throughout. Um, I mean, the the thing is, he made some, he actually, he made great, on a few key I mean, points, he owned he made, them. I mean, I'll give him that. I think, it, I think he did. And like, I mean, I don't think that people who are paying money to go see Tulsi Capra, Tim Pool. And James O'Keefe are necessarily um, winnable, um, but as that is going to sort of go out into the general public and some of the things that Ben has done with like clipping that, I think it can be helpful, uh, particularly the way that he framed the the free speech um, debate with him, where it's like, you know, y'all say you're for free speech. The number one threat to free speech in this country is the dictatorship of, of the bosses. Um, and we should want to have protections about this if you t take free speech seriously. Now, again, I don't think that that's necessarily pulling over James O'Keefe fans out there. Um, but like I'm somebody who engages in, in these kind of arguments a lot. And I won't say that like I've never maybe considered that before, but it re-upped it for me in a way that is, is helpful. And like there's value in sometimes going out there and having to push back against people um, in, a, in, a, in a direct way like that, um, that I think, you know, can be very, very uh, useful but i mean look i mean that 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 whole that whole world to me is very weird um the you know media personality slash like youtube podcaster debate world it's not something that i engage in i, I will say maybe less for like a more political reason though that there's a part of that mainly because i just do not have a, <laughs> the damn patience uh to sit there with somebody like tim pool talking about ben's per, what was it um he made this bizarre point about oh Ben making a was it 
qualitative argument or something like that, an ideological argument about unions, um, instead of it being a very, very clear material one in, in the case that Ben was bringing up there. Um, you know, just, just like the, the kind of weird debate bro tactics that those guys try to use sucks uh, when you're sort of trapped in a room with them because those people just aren't going to be able to see those things uh, very clearly because they've created like a mental palace around themselves uh, to prevent any kind of infiltration. But I will say, you know, we have a lot of people who watch both TMBS, um, mm -hmm. the Michael Brooks show and our show who have come over from being exposed to things. Um, not always necessarily just debates, like sometimes just like, like I've done this before with like Jordan Peterson on our program. I don't right, like right. to do, I don't like to do the dunking as much though. We do do it. It's good for views. Um, but like I'll, whenever we do that, I always try to do something at the end where it's like, you know, here is also why like Jordan Peterson's like theology even is bad. Like he made this really, I can't remember the exact point he made, but a really nasty, he has a really nasty view of God. And I'm not a believer, but I was just saying like, here's what this means. This is what this person is saying. And you will get messages from people. So like, I had thought about, like, I think that there's a value in engaging yeah. for sure. I made this uh, at the Jordan Peterson conference in Ohio in 2018. My, I had this weird uh, panel. I was sitting up there with a postmodern Christian and I was, you know, the postmodern Christian was uh, Peter Rollins. And, uh, and he was doing a lot of, you know, you can cool, interesting, pulling stuff in. And I was just like, look, I'm not a believer, but, from an Orthodox Christian standpoint, Jordan Peterson's a heretic, and if you believe him, you're going to hell. And like, <laughs> I was like, like, and I was just, and they're like, "What?" And I'm like, "Here's how." Bam, 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 bam. I just went through all these, uh, you know. Yeah, I did use a lot of David Bentley Hart and stuff in that. And I'm like, I'm not sharing this because I believe it. I'm sharing this because if you want to approach someone from their worldview. Mm -hmm. And you want to decouple them from this one pernicious thing first. You have to show them that they're being inconsistent with their prior worldview. It might not work because a lot of people are totally mm -hmm. instrumentalized. Um, but it is it is a tactic that I would use in a conversation. All right. Um, I talk to conservatives all the time. Fuck, I live in Utah, right? Like, like you live in Texas. Like, yeah, I mean, I we both live yeah. in like gomorrah in our states admittedly but um you know you know you and austin and me and slc but but i don't just work in slc mm -hmm. so it's it's something that i think people forget i think conversations with conservatives are actually quite useful on a one-on-one -on -one basis and i've even had some on air i don't like debating them because they come in guards up um mm -hmm. And I'm not when I have conversations my, with them, it's also I don't want to do the other thing, which is to concede a whole lot of points. I'm not going to concede a point with them. But the, the thing about a conversation versus like a debate with Tim Pool is they're not coming in with with confusing apologetics that are rhetorically deceptive in a conversation. Um, they might go there, but it'll be obvious to everyone watching that there's a switch and the, and the tactic will expose itself a lot of the time because the way people are talking will change. Um, and so that's a tactical difference. But I do what I, what I want to get to, though, is that I did think that James O'Keefe, uh, Tim Pool, Tulsi Gabbard thing says Don't a lot. Gabbard. Yeah, says a lot about where we're going in far as where the right actually is. Yeah, I, I mean, because the one thing I will also say, a lot of the Catholic religious right, um, I don't think we can make a lot of common cause with them. But I will say, um, they're not they're not as opposed to parts of our rhetoric uh, or even parts of our belief structure. Um, so one thing that I, I think that we should start talking about, and this I got again out of studies of stuff that happened in Chile, is not letting these Catholic... Uh, National conservatives be the only people talking about worker dignity because dignity sounds strange to us materialists. It's not something you materially define. And I also, I mean, I'm so trained as this materialist Marxist that I balk at the at, at that language. But then I look at it and I'm like, but it works. Mm -hmm. Like, it absolutely works um, because it combines both the solidaristic and the individual impulse. You bring that together. All right. Um, you don't let people play this whole individualism versus collectivism game because 
in that, I think a lot of people lose. I mean, um, I'm not saying that we should be we should be like talking about like Marxist individualism. I think we should be just be talking about things that appeal to an individual that also can help them feel like the group is in their interest mm -hmm. and in their understanding. Um, and they're good at that. Uh, whereas these kind of postmodernists, it's weird because with someone like James Lindney who hates postmodernism, but is also an example of the most nihilistic elements of the tendency. Like, I don't even I post totally agree. Like postmodern is not even a coherent category, but like, like that, if you're talking about like this whole rationalist irrationalism, something that sounds, it's taking rational premises to absolutely non-rational places and shutting your brain off. And if that's what you mean by like postmodernist relativism or whatever, um, they do that. Matt, 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 uh, Matt McManus is absolutely right that this is where they've gone. And a lot of times now they're not even bothering to make moral arguments anymore. It's just pure power arguments. It's mm -hmm. like, it's like uh, we've gone back to Carl Smith land and um, that's important to point out. And so like, while these evangelical, like yeah, I even pointed this out to someone the other day, I'm like, you know, we're talking about these evangelicals winning, but you got to admit um, the intellectual infrastructure isn't coming from the evangelicals. It's coming no, from it's a not. bunch of, Catholic reactionaries who are out of cool. step with their own church. So, mm -hmm. um, no, I'm, mm -hmm. I mean, totally. I mean, like, even just looking at like the recent like Texas GOP um, convention, it's it's a, a very frightening trend. Um, but it's it's wild to look at how out of step even that section is with the average Texas GOP primary voter. Where like John Cornyn, who gets seventy percent plus of the vote in the primary, um, gets booed at the uh, at the state convention. Uh, Greg Abbott, wild. who Greg Abbott, who's very likely you know to win this election coming up and could, will be the longest serving Texas governor in the state's history, wasn't even really um, present there. He had like a lunch outside of the official venue, like the day of, right? Um, and it, it's 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 interesting to see where that's going to end up going politically um, within, within that right wing movement. I totally agree. I think that people sort of have like bustles still from the Bush era of being very like worked up about the evangelical movement um, that I think is a bit of a mistake because it's sort of missing uh, what's going on with a lot of these new figures. And uh, I don't want to be dismissive of it intellectually just because I disagree with it. Um, but it is very incoherent to me where Dan Crenshaw um, also is like booed and harassed and Ted Cruz is like celebrated as like, you know, a conservative hero. Um, I mean, weird. when we had you on the, yeah, I agree totally. <laughs> um, when, when we talked um, a little while ago on, on my program about the right, um, you know, we were, we were starting to get to that question of like, well, you know, who is benefiting um, from this this sort of like new right movement? Um, and I, I still find it to be a very open question because it's not all these like figures of the new right who are necessarily like capturing the energy. I think DeSantis is going to be the interesting case of this, the case study of this. Because I'm pretty sure. I mean, that's he's a interesting. Totally. And he's like, because he's a Republican boy through and through. Um, but it has this Trumpist appeal for some reason. And I wonder how much of that is media portrayal so far versus actuality. Like once he starts going out there and engaging in nationwide politics, if that will maintain itself. Yeah. But, I can't see a lot of his state level policies being possible legally at a nation, even under totally, conservative totally. Supreme court. So it's like, um, the other thing I, I'm wondering, and, and here, here's where I get, here's where I want to really like, want people to think about this culture warring is also something democrats have tried to do and they've had to abandon because of the real material and and you, we can literally see it in the rhetoric that the amount of yes we still talk about minorities and this, and this stuff and, and but the amount of actual culture warring rhetoric from the democrats began pretty high in this administration and then yeah just plummeted um immediately um, and as things get better, I, I don't know that when you're on a, like when you're moving from a state, 
um, that has an okay-ish economic situation for the United States right now to the national level that the same stunts would work because you have to deliver on a much realer way. Mm -hmm. Um, if, if, you know, the kinds of things that DeSantis is doing won't do a damn thing about inflation. So it's, it's, uh, even from the most conservative standpoint, actually, not even from mine. And so like, it's, it's interesting to think, well, what will this actually look like? I mean, it's sort of the opposite of what I like to call the George W. Bush problem, where George W. Bush early on looks like a hyper moderate conservative, and then uh, he becomes what he becomes, um, mm-hmm. and then we—I mean, we 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 like collective amnesia after Trump, where we go back and thinking about him like he was all what his entire career was what he was in 2008 and in 1999, mm-hmm. and we're going to ignore him as governor of Texas and act most of his actual bloody fucking presidency. Um, and and I, I think also a lot of the you know people younger than you don't remember. They're too young to remember that time. We're now, you know, this is now mm-hmm. long enough ago where this seems like ancient history um, to some people. But I'm like, yeah, uh, there's a there's a reason why the Democrats came to power prominently. Actually, guys, like like mm-hmm. uh, like 2006 happened for a reason. Like. Um, and in 2002, you would have thought the Republicans were about to rule the country forever. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I do worry, though. There's a couple of trends that I worry about. One, that the left is so wedded to the Democrats. We're not going to ha- know how to handle this current this current urban pricing pushing people out, plus COVID, plus, plus, plus. So these liberal bastion stronghold cities are, are going to be less populated. And that could, you know, theoretically, that actually could be to, to our advantage, but so far it doesn't look like it's going to be. Um, and the other thing that I think we should be worried about is what we see is happening to labor in Britain. Um, mm-hmm. Look at the Boris Johnson scandal. You know what? You know who's not going to benefit from that? Labor? No. They're absolutely well, not. Uh, and... They've also foreclosed any kind of new Corbynism coming up from someone other than Corbyn. So so they seem to have accepted permanent opposition status. And like the, now the only thing that really matters... Now, it's a parliamentary system. There's different dynamics there than in our system. But I worry that the Democrats are headed for that too and that we're headed to be even more obscure despite our recurrence because of our political ties to Democrats. The the positive flip side of that, though, is that we're going to have to figure out how to do politics without relying on these old tricks and traps, and can we mm-hmm. do it? And that, to me, that's the challenge for the DSA. It's like, and wh- how, what's the strategic calculus on how far you're willing to go down the ship with the Democrats? And I, I think that, you know, you're talking about a lot of positives in the DSA, and I, 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 uh, I don't know enough to disagree with you. Um, and I think, I think I have seen a lot of the drop off of the most kind of like easily lampoonable stuff. Um, but we did see a hemorrhaging of members at the beginning of this year, like a real hemorrhaging of members. Um, so I think that's partly due with COVID, partly due with no one knows what we're doing now that Biden has. Been also, with. just like the way that that stuff's reported too. Yeah. Or for example, I lost my credit card and I was, <laughs> so my card got declined for membership. And, you know, that, that happens. That's a significant portion of entry and re-entry within the organization. But no doubt there's a, a dynamism that, that, you know, needs to be accelerating, uh, not just sitting pretty on. But I think, I think a lot of that is going to be dependent on how the, the DSA answers its questions about its relationship to the Democratic Party. Um, and I don't know that those have been clearly articulated. I've read both the original Ackerman and the recent Ackerman pieces uh i don't find either one of them particularly convincing um the dirty break yeah i didn't believe that well my problem with the dirty break if you're going to do a dirty break why the fuck would you announce it um like like i know i mean because it's not dirty if it's a projected and everyone knows um but the other problem is you have to build up a counter power base to support candidates not just getting them elected but actually supporting them to the democrats and that's that's really hard to do um, well, I mean, I think that, like, for example, 
the the tactic about the endorsements is is it's a very clear one, and a lot of people get very confused about that. Um, but the fact that, for example, like the DSA doesn't endorse a candidate just in every election, they endorse like their people, um, and that comes with a sizable commitment from the organization to like run a campaign and campaign and work with them, right? So it's not just like oh well, here's like a liberal versus you know a centrist, so we're going to endorse like the liberal even though they're out of step with our policy on a lot of things. It's like no, like you have to you have to meet like a pretty high threshold before you're going to get any of those kind of endorsements. Um, and two has been like a real commitment um, to, to doing that, like local level politics, which I think a lot of people miss um, mm -hmm. with the DSA is that because there's so much focus on like the squad and like the co congressional members, they forget that there's something like 400 members of like local state governments in the country right now who are DSA members. Obviously, you need to have a lot more than that when we're talking about a national scale party. But like, you know, it's just like in the same way, like, I don't know if you ever green, um, but, you know, whenever people would make the same argument against the Greens, it's like, well, you need to focus on local races. Like, well, the Greens do. And the Greens, I'm not pr promoting the Greens or anything like that. But it was just one of those things. It's like, well, you're really sitting far away from it to like not realize what's happening there. Um, the Green Party, I, I just almost don't even want to bring them up because that's just so riddled with problems and contradictions. But um, the fact is, is that like there has been a real effort to pivot towards this um you know, building local power. And I think, for example, in New York, uh, the New York slate is a really yeah, great. New tactic. York is where it's really been effective. Uh, but you can't the, the and I'm, I'm torn about this because from a from a strategic logic, what you want is a base like in New York. And then what you actually want is DSA as a real power player in purple areas that can fuck up Democrats because mm -hmm. then there'd be a reason to to do trading i'm just thinking like i'm thinking yeah now it's hard to imagine how the current dsa would do that um mm -hmm. because of the membership concentrations largely urban um uh despite rumors to the contrary it is not largely pmc or all college educated but it is largely urban and so that is where that is where things get a little bit more difficult um because if you if you take new if the DSA was able to really like do substantive policy in New York, um, and also hold people, and I have to bring it up like Salazar accountable, um, so that would mean pretty aggressive local politics, and I think that the DSA as an organization could do that. And I also when I talk to people about this, I am not I'm not like. I actually probably think for socialism to happen in America, something much radicaler than electoral strategy is going to have to happen. But I don't think without electoral strategy that that is possible. So, you know, um, not that I fetishize the Bolsheviks, but this is a classic Bolshevik position. There are times in which you participate in elections and times in which you don't. Um, and so the DSA strategy there isn't that different. The question becomes when when is the separation from the Democrats? Because the Democrats really are as a bunch of people have pointed out, including our friend Ben, including uh, even that Bernie tw that draft Bernie 2024 piece, which I wrote a, a response to, uh, did actually correctly posit that the Democrats, for the first time in 20 years, are a toxic brand. Like, for, for most of my adult life, the Republicans have been the more toxic brand. That is not true right now. Um, mm. So... Like my argument is, if we had ever had a time to establish an independent identity from the Democrats, I'm not necessarily meaning totally independent either. Like I'm not saying we wouldn't work with them, but it is right now. Like uh, particularly so, when the right takes Congress in a um, couple months, unless because uh, I don't well, see yeah, that, I mean, how that doesn't happen. I, so. I'll just I just want to note um, I, I I don't know the particulars of it well enough to debate one way or the other, um, mm -hmm. but like I, I do think that like Julia Salazar in, in particular has been like a very very beneficial member of like the socialist movement in New York and she's done an incredible amount of work um, you know providing for people part in like in real tangible ways you know from pushing back against brokers fees to pushing back against like landlord control of to say I think a lot of the attacks on on her recently haven't um, been completely fair but 
anyway, so I'm not prepared to, to debate that one way or the other. I don't keep up with New York politics that much anymore. But um, as to the question of like the, the popularity of the, the Democratic brand, um, I totally um, agree with that. I mean, that's something that I advocate for. And I think a lot of members of, of the DSA do as well. I think a lot of times people get conflate the DSA with the Democratic Party because people run on a Democratic Party ballot line. Um, but, you know, more than anything structurally, like that's just the reality of the fact that we have two corporations that control ballot access um, mm -hmm. in, in this country and overcoming that. Um, I don't think that the, the strength is, is there yet. I think that that I, I, I like so I, I like I agree with you on this. Um, I think that the question is, you know, how are we going to do that? Because it's just it's not necessarily worth it because like um Jabari Brisport, who looks like is going to win his, his seat in, in, in New York, hopefully, right? I was sorry, who, who won his seat in the state Senate, also ran for city council when I was in New York. Mm -hmm. um, and he ran as a Green. And it was, you know, nice campaign, but it, it didn't move, right? Um, anything. He ran as an independent socialist because they have multiple ballot lines you can run on there. Ran as a socialist and ran as a Green. And it just, you know, you just don't pick up the votes. And it's like, we got to figure out a way to beat that. Um, but that's like the current reality and that shouldn't preclude us from winning power and doing stuff when we if we have the opportunity to show up win a primary and then win a general through through the democratic party um i i i just like for me i i just i don't see um that question not being an active and live one within the organization nor there being a kind of embracing other than the national congressional figures of the democratic party for most of the people who are getting elected um, with DSA endorsements um, in the country, particularly like DSA members versus somebody who the DSA endorses. Because sometimes you get somebody who like comes from the social movements um, who's sort of tenuously engaged with DSA. And it's like, it's worth it to campaign for them because, you know, that's a progressive pro mm. this, this or that um, policy candidate versus somebody who's like a cadre, you know, like somebody who's like comes up in the organization, knows the positions is in it. You know, those are two different candidates. Um, and I think maybe explaining that um, is helpful. But I do think that um, a lot of members, particularly on the local and state level, are pushing back against, um, you know, the state party and the Democratic brand as a whole. Like, I don't find that absent. Maybe we could argue that it's more uh, that, that we need more than we currently have. But I oftentimes the terms of this debate sort of frustrate me just in the sense that I think people like the assumption is that like the D DSA is like, very happily just sort of coddling up to the Democratic Party and are wanting to be junior partners in that, that coalition, when I don't see that to necessarily be the case um, from one, most of the membership or two, many of the elected uh, officials, right? Like, I mean, like, again, using New York as, as an example of this, I mean, like, they're at war with the Democratic uh, leadership of that state because yeah. they're not in line with them. Same thing in, in Chicago um, and other places. And there's other places like, for example, Minneapolis, um, where there's members because of the way that that city is sort of uh, functions, where they're able to run at large seats um, independent. They're not members of the Democratic Party, which is great. And we interviewed one of them on our show. And it's like, that's absolutely wonderful. And I want us to be seeing that much, much more. But it's making the calculation. It's like, where do we have the capability of doing that versus where do we not? And then the second question is like, do we run sort of, you know, continually like doomed campaigns just because the way that most people vote in these places? I mean, you have to remember American politics in most cities is like one party dominate. Yeah, it, um, it is. I mean, it, the the what I would say is part of the. Oh wait, problem can I just say one more thing, just really quick? I am like a huge advocate of of this. Is that like we it, it it needs to be made as explicit as possible. I mean, I so I support a dirty break, but I always say like if we're doing a dirty break, especially as you're saying, announcing it early, then it's like doing that work now. Like literally just being like, we're running as Democrats because they, they, can, they control this thing. This is what we're running on. I don't think you put that in every ad because I don't think that really is mobilizing or motivating for no. most people. But I do think like, totally, I, I, I advocate for this a lot. Like, and, it, and a willingness to be antagonistic is very, very, um, is it, it, something that particularly if it's not even the elected officials themselves, you know, the organization does. But then you also get into the question is like, what is the DSA, right? Is it like national statements from the organization or is it what's being said by members? Is it people like me saying things like that on, on this podcast, right? And it's like, that is where it gets a little bit tricky because there's undoubtedly um, a, a very strange text, tension, text, um, tension between, you know, chapter and national right now that I think, again, internally within the organization 
is the the site of like probably some of the most um, energized debates and and fights that are happening. It's like what that relationship needs to be looking like. So there's a lot there, and I I think the DS people will be like you guys just agree each other. DSA is where we're going to disagree, um, but you knew that. Um, hopefully, if you, you weren't warned, um, the, the the issue that I think I, here's where I do agree with you. If you're going to take an electoral strategy, the strategy has to be um, you have to play the game as it is played in the state and locality you are in. So, if you can run as an independent ballot person, you sh- in it you should absolutely I not totally agree. run as a Democrat. And, and more importantly, we need to start building the parent institutions because one of the, I have a, I have a friend, I'm not going to mention their name. Uh, they, they're in rural Washington um, who got a port commission position. And because they went as an independent the, the, um, in a fairly conservative area, uh, even though they're trying some lefty socialist thing. And it's, it's fairly, they're, they're, they're doing things that are fairly popular in their area, but they had, they had to learn everything trial and error because there was no institutional support. Mm -hmm. And you don't realize how much, I mean, even shit like how to run Robert's rules of orders correctly is, is something that the average person does not know. Um, Mm. And so we have to develop like, these cadre, these cadres. The one thing I would say, and I think the DSA is not terrible on this, but is not coherent on this because the DSA, like the United States, is hyper federalized. Um, is how do you run your your para electoral stuff, and what do you do with that? Um, like for example, AFL CIO, AFL CIO. I, I, there are people. You know, I'm in a union. I'm a union rep. Um, AFL-CAO at the national level is my fucking enemy. Like, like the the the, the AFL-CAO national. So, I, like, I want people to listen to this because it's important. There's not that big a difference if you're in the DSA than if you're in a business union on this question. Your national is probably going to be something you are highly ambivalent about at best, and maybe hostile to, on average, um, and. So I think that dynamic is a similar dynamic to the DSA. Uh, the, the reason why I'm more, I'm a little bit more critical of the DSA is because there isn't a program that unites it. So the locals can be wildly divergent um, on, a, on a lot of ways. And, and they're also, except in two states, I think New York and California, there also aren't intermediate regional and state level organizations. And so a lot of these informal caucuses have to serve that role because it's not there. There's only local and national, except in California and New York, and maybe a few other states. But I know a large part of the country, there is no regional DSA organization. Um, so, and, there, and there, that's something that's starting to, to shift. Like, so there's mm-hmm. effort, efforts right now to, you know, create some kind of structure for Texas because um, we have big chapters in Austin, Dallas, Houston, and San Antonio. It's a big fucking state. It's a big state, yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, the caucus stuff is like, I don't know structurally if caucuses were like the best solution to to these things because one, they can be, you know, antagonistic to like the work of, you know, building up a cohesive internal line on these, uh, external line on these things. I'm all for encouraging as much like debate internally as possible. Um, but you see, I mean, and then also like, then you end up having like a little subset of the organization that's very hyper interested in like this issue. Um, that's not also reflective of structural power within the organization, which is always going to lead to kind of, you know, power, you know, testing your strength, power fights. I and mean, this just sort of human and most importantly, political nature that that's going to end up happening. It's like, you know, you're going to want to see if that caucus and even working groups too. Um, which, which we saw with like the, the BDS Palestine. Oh stuff. yeah, that's a that's um, a different mess. We're not going to go into that today, though. That's that, no, that's, no, that's like a whole thousand star point for. I don't think anybody liked the way that went. Um, also, you would need to have somebody who could just be a neutral historian to like set it up for maybe an hour before you could really have a conversation. Right. About well, it, that, that's the whole problem. It's like even get the, this. This is one problem I do have with left things in general. We mm. are very bad 
uh, I mean, the DSA is actually. Uh, I'm gonna give it. I'm gonna give it a praise, which I don't normally do. It's remarkably transparent. It's not all in the same place, but like I can find where the DSA monies goes. I don't mm. necessarily agree with all of it, but it's not wasted and it is transparent. You have to dig, but it's there. Um, I can find uh, the. I can find chapter vote histories usually, um, yeah. which, which in a lot of sectarian organizations you can't even find out who the fucking members. Like I, I like I don't even mean like. No, there's reasons why you want people to find every individual member's names, but you can't. Like, for example, when the ISO dissolved in 2014, we didn't know how big it was till it dissolved. Mm -hmm. No one out, no one outside of the, not even in the organization, no one outside of the leadership of the organization really knew how big it was. It took its dissolution for it to become public knowledge. So that kind of shit is DSA is great on. Um, one of the issues with the caucus system is the caucus system kind of serves two functions and they're not, they're kind of at odds with each other. So the caucus system functions as this intermediate between the locals and, and the nationals when there's no regional or state level organization. Um, but the caucus are also political tendencies. Now yeah. I think having political tendencies in this organization is good. I am a multi, like I think a socialist movement has to have multi tendencies, but I think having your political tendencies and your intermediate leadership orgs, be the same thing means you basically have parties within parties that are that may yeah. not be solid heuristic uh because the tendency is doing more than just trying to battle for a political line on the platform they're trying to stack the npc and they're the way to get to the npc and so that becomes a bigger problem um uh so, but this for those people not in DSA, they're like, "What the fuck are you guys talk about? This is this is uh, all inside." But I think people need to understand these inside of baseball structural issues. Mm -hmm. I think the, the the big thing for me, when, uh, and I'm not a DSA member, but I I work with the DSA, and the reason why I'm not a DSA member is I am more ambivalent than most people about giving my money to to national level Democrats in any way, form, or fashion, and the only time I accept it. Is when it's from a union, and I don't even like that. So, for example, I'm I'm one of the few AO reps who won't donate to the stupid lobbying thing because I don't want to like like I'm like nope, I don't want it going to certain candidates. Sorry, I'll 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 canvas for you. I'll do what I need to do. I'll vote, you know, I'll vote strategically, but not giving you money. Um, but there's also a way, you know, when I talk about popular front versus united front and this that, and the other, there's a way, and I want to point this out for people. That's not helpful in the United States. Because all those strategies, even though I endorse one of them, need to be rethought in America because they're built for a parliamentary system. They're not built for the American congressional system. Um, so things like they assume party, uh, they assume multi-party coalitions in a parliamentary government. They do. Mm -hmm. um, that does not happen in the United States. There is no way for a minor party... Um, outside of occasional independent individuals to caucus. And then they caucus as individuals like Bernie Sanders and not as like, say, the Socialist Party of America or whatever, um, because we don't have a parliamentary system at all. I mean, the parliamentary system wouldn't fix a lot of our problems. It still ends up being pretty much by, you know, uh, party duopoly uh, in most cases. But there are certain strategies that the socialist movement used to use that it cannot use in America because our electoral system does not work that way. Um, and so in that, in that sense, I am sympathetic to the DSA's inability to like really say, like, well, what do we pull from from history? Because all of our historical examples, frankly, are from European countries with an entirely different governmental structure as how their democracy works. Um, I, I, and then I'm going to give you another part where I'm sympathetic to the DSA. And this, I think, is a problem of all socialists now. Our media is not attached to one location. You and I, like, for example, I thought about boosting local stuff on my show once, doing a bunch of stuff about Utah-oriented left stuff. Well, But why? I have a Utah audience. It's about 30 people. Yeah. yeah, out of out of, you know, this video will probably get 
one to two to three thousand views in a couple in a month, right? But only about thirty people are in the locality where I actually live and do politics. So my media mouth point is not useful for local politics. But local politics is the foundation, is the absolute foundation of how we would build even, even frankly, a non-electoral political party in the United States. It has to happen locally because, A, locally is where you have access and, the, and the, you don't need a bajillion, gajillion dollars to do it. And B, um, it's also where you meet people and build that solidarity and build that interpersonal trust, which, mm-hmm. which by the way, the right does understand and does. Like mm-hmm. that's, um, and so I've been when I talk about inside outside strategies, I guess I guess one thing I would say is we've done bad about about really getting the public to understand the outside part of the outside strat of the inside outside strategy. And I, I think that's a fair criticism. What what I'm trying to like express more than anything is that sometimes what frustrates me about outside criticisms of of the DSA is when, and I'm not accusing you of this, but just especially a lot of the stuff that you get online from some of the people who are least likely to make the suggestion that you did, for example, that you joined an organization. Um, I won't name any names, but there's a very kind of like dissatisfied post Bernie movement that, you know, they're just against it. They're just so, against it all. Right. Yeah. The, the, the post left, anti left, and sometimes left communist haters. Uh, yeah. As so, someone vaguely seen as aligned with left communists, I know what they're like. Yes. <laughs> um, we don't name you know, names, is, but I can name 10. Is that like there's, there is, there is this assumption sometimes that I think is sort of promoted by, by those folks in particular that like there isn't like an active fight and struggle right now. Cause I mean, you got to remember like, this is an organization that was inherited by people who don't even really share the same kind of political trajectory as like the founders of the organization, you know, like the prehistory of, of DSA versus like the modern um, sense of it, I think is most influential, mainly in the organizational structure of the DSA at, at large versus like the political positions of the membership. If you get what absolutely I mean. agree with you, like there aren't many inherent in the yeah. DSA, but it, they did write the constitution, so it's yeah. sort of it's sort of a problem. <laughs> well, no doubt, but I mean, again, it's it's not one of those things that is being like rapidly enforced by folks because of you know the reasons that they don't have those same, same kind of convictions. Very happy to to see the things I think we both know we're talking about go away, particularly kicking people out for being members of any democratic centralist organization or stuff like that. But um, what frustrates me sometimes is that like there are these fights um, that are happening within the organization that like I'm involved in, um, you know, and and I watch and I try to influence people on because I I totally agree. Like, I think the biggest tragedy that could happen out of this upswing in like democratic social, socialist organizing right now is some kind of failed attempt to like reform and fix the democratic party. It's it's a waste of time. It'd be disastrous. It would condemn us to, you know, if, if people, if we felt people were depoliticized sort of, pre-Obama years and then after Obama disappointment, nothing would come close to taking all of this energy and, 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 and movement that we've seen over the past few years and use that to sort of funnel and try to reanimate the party of Nancy Pelosi. Um, so like these are like the contradictions, but like we have to be able to, to dance with them and in the sense of like how close is the organization to the Democratic Party? Um, I, I think that there's an outside perception that they're much closer um, than they are it's different in each situation. Like AOC is one of them. That's, that's, that's notable. Like on our program, most of the time we talk about AOC, it's to criticize her. Um, I did, I have been saying that, you know, some of the stuff that she's been saying about the Supreme court lately regarding the abortion decision is a very, very good infusion right. into the way people think about the court. I mean, she, she straight up called them delegitimate that they delegitimize themselves and it's the job of Congress and the president to push back against them as somebody who wants to abolish that institution. That's great. So I'll praise her for that. But for her as an example, like she's somebody who was sort of shot out of a cannon of this organization, not really knowing that this was going to be a successful, who is now a political superstar. And like, what's her connection with the movement? It's tenuous at best. And again, as I said on, on our program last week, it's like, I don't trust her until I see her standing inside the movement, not sometimes next to it or around it. Right. Like these are active questions and these are questions that are debated within the organization 
itself. And, and the point, the reason that I'm so adamant about it um, is that one, it's doing, it's winning victories and showing people that getting engaged in politics is a way to meaningfully change their lives. Um, if you look at the growth that you're seeing, particularly here in Austin, you know, people from the community are showing because they're realizing that in Austin in particular, this is an institution that has the power to win. Not always. We had a pretty disappointing um, last round of elections other than Greg Kassar, um, who is going to be in Congress very soon, um, who unfortunately, um, because of the Palestine stuff, had to be dropped um, from from the organization officially. There's some technicalities as he didn't officially drop, he withdrew his endorsement or whatever. But um, by the way, like somebody who I very much endorse on a lot of things, I think is probably going to be much more pro-worker than anybody in the squad that we've seen so far. What he did when he was the DSA member, member representing in the city council of Austin was hugely important for building up the movement and that, that capacity. So the point is, is that like, there are tensions within the organizations, which I totally agree with, particularly relationship with the Democratic Party. But it's not like these are being addressed or being argued about and trying to figure a way out of it. Because at the end of the day, it's like we can say we don't like the Democratic Party. But like if you are in an area where having ballot access on the Democratic Party line is pretty much a prerequisite for winning that election, you know, just having the right critique about the the Democratic Party being like the graveyard of social movements, it doesn't get us anywhere closer to power versus being able to take advantage of, of the moment that we're in, building up inroads with communities who still like they might be, a lot of them are workers, right? And people who we want in our coalition, but they still consider themselves um, to be Democrats, right? Um, you know, I think a lot of people sort of do miss that fact that like there are a lot of people who are workers who consider themselves to be Democrats or like liberals even. Um, and the point is to move them from that position into socialism and like, <clears throat> excuse me, this vehicle that, that is being built right now is imperfect and it's always, it's, it's shifting dramatically. It's just in the past five years, it's shifted dramatically um, into being a vehicle that we can adequately do that. And like, I think engaging in those fights within the organization is probably one of our best chance of seeing some form of a national socialist movement slash party um, that, that I've seen compared to any other um, organizations or structures that we have currently. Um, particularly one thing that's been really exciting for me in the organization has been this new um, push toward what they're calling the rank and file strategy, um, which is not just like, we love workers, we love unions. It's saying, hey, if you're looking for a job, get a job in a unionized workforce. Um, or if you work in a non-union job, we will set you up with people who can help you transition from a non-union to unionized employment, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a transition from what like Panitch and Gimden would call like class focused politics to class rooted politics that I think is extremely exciting to say to people, it's like, you know, it's not enough just to show up and vote as, as we were talking about earlier. Like this has to be rooted in the labor movement, rooted in the working class. And like, that's the activity and the shifts that I'm seeing. So it's like, yeah, there are big fights on the NPC. And there are things that certainly um, are, are needing to be worked out. And, and those fights are happening. Who knows which way they'll go. Um, but we're also seeing that in tandem with victories, with actual results to show, and with an orientation of embedding itself within labor and within the working class movement, that I just can't sit here and say that I'm not very excited um, and think that that's, that's a positive direction uh, for the movement to go. And it, 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 it's imperfect, but like politics is imperfect, right? And this is the, this is, the place that we can have these fights in a constructive matter that actually goes from just fighting about who's right about this or that to actually winning power and delivering for people. Right. Well, uh, I think that's a good point to start wrapping this up on. We've been talking for quite a while, but I do think, I do think that last point kind of goes back to something we were talking about at the beginning, and that is actual politics even if you're, say, a non-statist or whatever, because, mm -hmm. you know, as a Marxist, ultimately, I, I want to get rid of the state, but I'm, as I, as I remind people, but not immediately, because that would be a fucking disaster. <laughs> um, uh, but what you are doing in politics is building, in, in the small P sense, is building social and political capacity, and you can't build it in the small C sense if you don't participate at all in the large P sense of politics. Totally. There is that. And so depolitization does not lead to people becoming more socially aware, 
our more vibrant yeah. social sphere, which we can oppose the, you know, which we can then oppose the evil capitalist state. Like, I wish that was true. It's not true. It's just like mm. it's 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 it's. Not, I don't see any evidence for that. Um, and so there's a sense in which I always tell people, look, you don't want to be sectarian, or maybe you do. Like I, I actually would say I'm I am a sectarian, but what you don't want is a is a total intransigence of sectarians of one. Um, uh, and by that I mean like people who are hyper ideologues, but they don't even have an organization which they're an ideologue to you. They're just ideologues. Um, I do think even if you have pretty far left uh, socialist communist views and you are of the in the pretty far left of the labor movement, um, to abstain from participating in these debates at all and abstain and participating in these elect politics at all is irresponsible. And to leave it totally to the rhetorical space of social media it's not just irresponsible, it's damaging. And it's damaging not just to the politics. It's da- I would actually go so far, it's damaging to you. Like, oh, it will, yeah, it's not good. <laughs> you know. Um, We're like, and, Barn and I are looking out for y'all's soul. Yeah, yeah, for real. Like, you don't, like, <laughs> like, uh, like, there's a reason why social media is tied to high depression in kids. I don't think it's the only reason. I mean, like, the world's falling apart, so I mean, there's that. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I think we have to approach this with with a very sort of open mind on what's going to work, um, and so conversely, for all the criticisms I have of the ESA, and like I just I admit it, I'm not a member. Um, I'm also not a person who, despite this, won't work with them. Uh, in fact, I invite them to shit all the time. Sometimes it's great. Sometimes it's terrible. Sometimes I feel like I'm walking DSA people and all left people. I mean, and how to be basic human beings. I mean, and we all know that we've encountered this. Like, um, you know, a lot of people's first for way into politics is also, frankly, their first for way into non scholastic social life at all. Um, and it's sometimes somewhat frustrating to remember that. It's, you know, I mean, I had this long conversation once with a bunch of DSA men. And I, I'm not going to mention names because it would be embarrassing, but a lot of it was like, treat women better because it will keep them in your organizations. You won't have to throw all of them into the leadership immediately and burn them out. Side note, because of the quota thing and that does happen in the DSA. And, and, uh, and then also you might keep your girlfriend too. Like, like it might help you be, I don't know, a better person um, and be better in your relationships. And I, I do think a social organization, no, we should not be like, we're not a dating society. That's not what I'm saying here. In fact, I, I would hope the opposite is true in a lot of ways. Yeah. But we should be encouraging people to be better across the board because it will also make better subjects for politics. People who have their shit together are better are better actors. And I, and I don't think, like, there's a certain amount of, I, I hate, all this super hyper individualized responsibility rhetoric, but I also hate the opposite where we pretend like the answer to that is like to not talk about personal responsibility at all. Um, the thing is, you know, these kind of groups, if they're functioning well, will encourage the kinds of solidarity, the kinds of social integrity uh, because of the way they interact. Uh, yes, there's going to be mild actors. Yes, there's going to be bad faith politics. That is true across the board at all times in politics. That's something you have to, because, mm-hmm. I mean, and, and literally, if you've ever played a fucking role-playing game, like, you'll see these social dynamics, like, like, that's, it's beyond, to complain about that in the left is, like, to complain about people, it's a water, oh, yeah. it's, it's, it's the water being it's wet. It's the most boring conversation, too, I'm yeah. sorry, like, when people are like, the left is this, or the left is, I mean, we've done a decent amount of that on the show, in fairness, but, like, there's a lot of times it's like, you, you can insert any other group. Um, into yeah. that, and it's like you just like want to talk about people who annoy you, which is fine, right? And and also like, yeah, these tendencies are real on the left, but sometimes even I have to remind myself, let's let's look at them very carefully because sometimes they're just the way politics operates in our in our broken ass society in general. Mm. Like that's the actual problem. <laughs> um, but so to end on that note. Uh, when I said we should all we should all be sectarians, I, what I mean by that is we should all have beliefs and fight for them. 
but we also have to put there is a limit to that and that limit is um i you know i'm i hate when liberals use this argument about pragmatism like because i do like i i detest it because it's often not actually even pragmatic it's usually a shut the fuck up argument but there is a sense in which politics is about compromise amongst people who share a basic belief set and a basic set of material interest um the latter is probably more important than the former even the material interest being shared and having mutual skin in the game is probably even more important than the belief set but both kind of are required and so like while we're going to fight it out and there's a place to fight it out there's ways to fight it out there's also a limit and if you're trying to constantly tear down people who uh when you look at a worldview set and it share 80 percent of you and you want to not just tear them down and win the argument and the organization, but you want to tear them down totally and wage total war on them. Um, I don't, don't be surprised when everyone's too alienated to do shit because you can't wage internal total war all the time and have positive consequences, Mm -hmm. nor honestly, are you going to grow as a person because everything requires total war. (laughs) It's like, I mean, there are things that do like, Like, I do think, for example, there are some lines that as a socialist movement, we cannot cross um, because they would destroy our core beliefs and we should not have solidarity with people who do. But I think those lines are not have to be pretty explicit. Like, I'm not looking for people to, like, implicitly, unknowingly hold certain. Yeah, yeah. Kind of stuff. Yeah. Find the reactionary within yourself. I mean, which, which, by the way, there almost always is a reaction. Like, I always joke, and I'm not really joking, that if you gave me absolute power, I'd be super Stalin. Like, I would just get rid of everybody who didn't agree with me. And because, you know, trauma, and and also that kind of power does that kind of thing to people. Like, that's just what most people would do. It's actually one of the only smart things Jordan Peterson ever said, and he used it to make a very dumb point. Um, but... Uh, the 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 issue is we're building socialism if we build it at all which is an open question um together or we're not building it and that's where the end of the road meets um and we're gonna have disagreements and we're gonna have fights um but if you can't get over that and you can't be responsible about that you know I, i'm torn on whether or not i want you in the movement like mm-hmm. part of me is like yeah we need everybody but part of me is like yeah but if you're totally just gonna destroy everything all the time then uh do we need you Mm -hmm. i don't know um probably i mean part of me just like you gotta have some you gotta have some basic solidarity or it's not gonna work and so that's the the crucial point and i think the other crucial point that i that i've gotten from our conversation is we need to think better about how we frame politics outside of like progressive strongholds um and question a lot of the framing that's given to us from liberals because even I have, you know, because it's so endemic in the in anything you read, um, that totally getting out of that framework takes a while to do, and you're going to be inconsistent about it. Mm-hmm. Um, so those are the two things. Because I think, you know, why we've been talking about like all these problems with neoliberalism. I'm just if people were really like listening to the micro data of what we were saying, we probably said some vaguely individualistic neoliberalist thing somewhere in this conversation too. Like that's not really the point. And um, that's, yeah, it would be nice to, if someone finds it, points it out, it'd be great. Uh, be, do it constructively. Um, but because it's the society we live in, even when we're aware that it's a problem fully moving away from, it's going to take a while. So, we both have to be super vigilant about it, but also kind of forgiving when people do it, because Mm. I guess this is one of the things that I took away from Michael Brooks when uh, he was alive is I always loved this quote from him is like, be absolutely brutal to systems. I would add also be brutal to ideas, but do not be unnecessarily cruel to people. Um, Because that's a bad impulse to engage in. It's anti-solidaristic. It, I think it backfires. I think it actually, if you do it enough, it'll, it makes you a worse person to totally. work with, to be around. And it, 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 um, you know, that, that kind of mentality again is, is like treating politics as like a space for your like own personal, 
mm-hmm. psychological gratification, which is not its point. I'd also add that Michael also reminded people a lot, don't be weird, um, <laughs> which was that, you know, we need to also be making socialism and this movement an attractive place for people to want to spend their time and energy in because we need people to want to be able to spend their time and energy in these kind of movements. And you need to be making them places that people want to be and want to be engaged in. And obviously the goal at the end is a good motivation, um, but there's no reason to make these places hostile and horrific and filled with abuse. Like they oftentimes unfortunately have become. Yep. And I think that is a great place. And I thank you so much for giving me so much of your time today, David. It's yeah, been man. great talking to you and getting to know you over the night. Uh, well, now I guess five hours between. Hell yeah, man. Almost and yours. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I'm kind of infamous for doing longer shows. Um, so uh, thank you for coming on. Um, uh, do you have anything you want to plug before you go? Um, you know, y'all can check us out at left reckoning me and Matt Leck, former producers of the Michael Brooks show. Talk about left politics with the, special focus on the South and particularly Texas in my case. Um, and uh, I have that piece in Jacobin. Uh, I highly hope that people check that out and let me know what you think. Also, it's a little pre, um, but I think we're going to be doing some stuff with our friends at this is revolution on a semi regular basis soon. So keep your eye out for that. I'm going to cross my, uh, my fingers for that. Um, as the sometimes why, as the sim, as a person who also is a semi regular on this is revolution, it would be a, a interesting space to be in. Thank you so much. Oh yeah, brother. Thank you. Have a good night.